Later. Sorry, I, I was on mute. What? Can't hear you, Ben. Speak up. <laughs> hello, hello. Hello, Ben. Are you there? You're muted. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's recording for us. Okay. All right. Uh, welcome to uh, <clears throat> Real Time Software Development One. This is also called SE485. These are just uh, same, same, same thing, just different labels. Just uh, it started out as a game class, and it's really a software engineering class. And uh, some people are scared of the word game. It's the same. So, so uh, that's the origin of that dual meaning. Let me close the door and start. All right. Uh, all right, welcome. Um, all right, so today is the nicest, easiest day we'll have. Um, I'm like, did I lock it? No. Uh, of the quarter, so enjoy, relax, um, absorb, right? All right, so uh, what I wanna do is kind of give you an understanding of what the class is about. We'll go into some material. Um, but it's really to kind of set expectations and, and set the new problem I just found today. So, all right, let's start off with what is this course? All right, let me go with that. All right, so um, let's go over the overview of the course, right? So um, this is the housekeeping part, but I don't want you guys, but I'm, I'm kind of getting into that burnout stage, right? I'm still on fumes. So um, we'll start this quarter a little bit slower and kind of get us up to speed as we go. But um, just kind of keeping things in uh, perspective here, just remember, no matter what you do the rest of your life, you're never as cool as a monkey riding a bull. <laughs> I mean, it's just it's something to keep in mind that, you know, we like to think we're doing cool stuff, but that's cool. Right. And if it was a flying blue monkey, that'd be off the shelf. That'd be even better. Right. Did anyone actually catch that joke? What? The Wizard of Oz? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just checking. Yeah. And no, everyone knows Wizard of Oz. It's, it's common knowledge. And also, <laughs> is also it? yeah, it is. And okay. we all know that Wizard of Oz was actually written here in Chicago. There's an Oz park somewhere on the north side, I think. They got statues. Yeah. All right. So, why did you guys take this class? I'm curious because uh, what I'm really excited about. Is we have a lot of students. This is the largest version of this class ever in the last 12 years. Um, I'm insanely excited about that, um, which means we can do a lot of cool stuff, right? And the, these classes here is self-selecting. Most of the students who get to here want this material. So we don't have a lot of those students who are, who are just, you know, struggling and failing and like, I don't know what I, I don't know if I want to do hard stuff, you know. I don't know if I want to get paid a lot of money when I leave school. I want to have a you know smaller job. You know, students here want money, want to do hard, cool stuff. So we're already in a better group, right? So I'm excited about that. So why did anybody take this course other than it was required? So some people have it required, some people are taking it optionally. Anyone? You, you, cool. you said it's cool here. What? You said it's cool. Cool, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's multi-threading, baby. I'm like, uh, this is not multi-threading. Right. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'll see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. Tomorrow's multi-threading, which is, a, is, is fun. Oh, but yeah, well, this class here could be multi-threading. And so what we do is this class is a three-class sequence. So this is the first one, real-time multi-threading. Uh, real service. They got me safe. <laughs> real-time uh, software development one. Right. Then real-time software development two. And it's actually real-time software development three, but I changed the name because it's GPU architecture. So the reason why I say it's GPU architecture for the third one is we're going to be taking everything we do in each class, moving it, moving it. Then we're going to hit it with, I don't know, say a thousand processors. And so that's why we're going to go, the last class is called GPU architecture. It's really the third class. And if you look in the catalog back when it used to be called engine one, engine two, engine three, mm. but I'm like, uh, I'll make it a little sexier. GPU <laughs> architecture, right? So that's the last class, right? Okay. Um, is gonna rip that. <laughs> so anybody scared or worried about this class? Not this one. This this one's pretty safe. Um, 
the material is uh, is all reachable. It's not designed to be hard. Um, the you're doing more and more complicated things. So the coding, unlike Space Invaders class where you just code, code, code with the side of coding, this is a lot less coding, ridiculously a lot less. But it's going to be a little bit more head scratching, a little more, uh, a little more. Uh, you have to stop and think about things and try things out, right? But what we're going to get into this class is we're making a large system, real time system. So we're making libraries. So we're going to create libraries from scratch. We're going to integrate the libraries. We're going to do complicated build systems, and we're going to also do conversion of real time assets. So this is like the real deal, right? Um, so we're going to worry about performance not necessarily at the cycle level. There'll be times like next week when we talk about math libraries, um, I'll tell you that you can add SIMD or AVX or, or more advanced stuff, but it's not required for this course. So, you know, this course is to get you through it in C++. I want to point out like, if you want to do something in the summer, here's a cool thing to do in the summer. If you want to do something, you know, later with research, you can add this to the class, but it's not required, right? Um, Anybody like nervous that they're not able to handle this? I, you shouldn't be. This this to me is is this is about as basic of a course as as as, as they come. Every week there's something new. It's a bit more steady state, right? So any questions about this class or any of the the ride on this? Yes. We said conversion of real time assets. Is that like that FBX converter thing? Um, we're not going to use FBX converter. That's how we used to use it. Um, FBX is so, so was it, what year is this 2023? Yeah. <laughs> so that, that is so 2021. <laughs> you know, like, that's so 2021. We're not doing that. That's so old school. Like how dare you bring up something a year and a half old, right? Two years old. Um, we're going to be using this uh, other technique called uh, GLTF. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It's, a, it's a new format that actually is used in AR and VR. It's 1,000 times better than uh, FBX. And uh, for those who don't know, FBX is a format for graphics and animation. Um, uh, but we're going to do something a little different with that. We're going to actually do real-time asset conditioning. We're going to use the same stuff that Google uses. So we're going to use Google protocol buffers and kind of go into that. And um, I was first exposed to Google protocol buffers when I was consulting for the um, federal government analyzing high frequency trading code that uh, the traders were doing illegal stuff. And I'm coming through this like, what the hell is this? And they were using Google protocol buffers because they were mining all the news feeds in Russia and worried about the winter wheat prices. <laughs> and so they take every single clip and every little blog, they put it into this pile and then they would run time analyze this and give a strong confidence that the that the wheat crop is going to be strong or weak that year. Um, and I'm like, okay, wait a minute. They're using it for high frequency trading to make money. Mm. Google's using it to mine the crap out of you guys, you know, <laughs> making sure you know which web pages you look at I and think start. I'm good. <laughs> right? Um, so um, you should probably look into this. And I talked to a couple of uh, former students from here, and they're like, oh, we're using it in the banking systems, we're using it in other places. So this is a really kind of cool thing. So Google profile buffers, we'll, we'll get into those. Uh, other questions? Was that just with wheat or did you do other commodities? Um, I did, uh, I did, I worked for the uh, F Federal Trade Commission. Commission. No, it's the four letters, FTC, <laughs> C T F C said, yeah, I know there's whatever they're down the street. Um, <laughs> and we, we, uh, we looked at securities futures, um, for CBOT, CME, stuff like that. Cool. And I was the, I was part of the government. So I was the guy who they would subpoena the code and then we put the code in a room and then I would have to analyze the code without just a text editor, which is like, you just want to like shoot yourself in the face. It's horrible. Um, no, they weren't allowed to because they have uh, um, white room rules. Um, how much does this course build on your design system or uh, design patterns class? This, uh, design patterns are going to be littered through everything even today. Okay. Uh, so the catch here is if you don't know your design patterns, and uh, let's, let's, let's put it this way. 
half, I'll say three quarters of the population went through SE 456, right? The Space Invaders, which is pretty hardcore design pattern course. Um, and the other rest of you probably taken it through 450, um, the standard design pattern course. One of the difference between those two classes, um, and you can start blogs and talk about it, but one of the differences is real time viewpoint of the patterns versus non real time. And so in this class here, we're going to be using patterns as a tool bag that we grab and say, you know what, we got to organize stuff. Oh, what do we want to do? Oh, we need to put in some kind of collection. Let's put it into a composite pattern. Oh, we need to touch everything in that collection. We'll add an iterator to it. So we're not going to be doing patterns for pattern reasons. We're doing patterns even like that problem screams pattern. So we just grab the pattern and use it. But we're going to be using it in a um, real time way. So we're, we're worried about um, pooling, we're worried about uh, unnecessary allocations, um, you know, accessibility and stuff like that. It's a good question. If your patterns are weak, don't worry, they'll get better. It's One better. another question. Uh, yeah, how much of uh, CSE 461 are we will we be using in this course? Uh, this is all in C++. So yes. Uh, yeah, um, no, I mean, like, uh, do we do any optimization or? No, we're not. Like gonna, basic everything we're going to code is going to be using optimized techniques. We're not going to sit there and say, okay, do this in SIMD. We're not doing it at that level. Um, we're going to be always aware of, so it's kind of like this, when we're doing a design, I'm going to look at the data layout and, and talk with you like, oh, well, if we move around this, we get better cache hits, right? Oh, guess what? You know, we just did an inheritance and there was a virtual pointer there. Okay, that knocked off our alignment because we just added a V table to it. So, you know, all this stuff there is we're going to be doing return value optimization all over the place. We're going to be using proxies, you know, one or two places where it's appropriate. So it's not going to be heavy core only um, optimized stuff. We're just going to take the highlights from that. So I kind of assume that the optimize is in your pocket and then I'm going to re flush and reintroduce the material that we need from that course as needed. So it's not like, you know, you're not going to get the final for the optimization, you know, in class here in no way. Um, though that was kind of fun. Uh, other questions? Everything's is there in there a final or a final project? Which, what's the final? Is it a, a yeah, test or? We'll, we'll go through that. Yeah, it's, it's a final project and oh, also a final essay, which is you know, don't worry, it's it's better than it sounds, right? All right, let me just go through this, right? You design pattern that talks in the goals. All right. <laughs> what about the graphics? What? What about the graphics we are using OpenGL, right? This is fine. Um, who knows? <laughs> right. We are wow. using it. Did, did I lose this? Honestly, I'm losing track of which is this class and which is the other one. Don't worry, they all kind of go together. <laughs> also, I'm pretty sure a meeting has a T in it. All right, well, I had different times and different dates on this stuff. Um, it just must not have happened. I'm now like freaking out. Where did... Call us in. Um, was this the right date? Um, the date was right. The date was right. Oh, no, no, the date's wrong. wrong. Never mind. Ah. Never mind. This is last year's. All right. Um, all right. So we'll do a commercial break here. Let me just upload the right one. Um, all right. I'm like going, what the hell? Some of the students are hot. And it's also game engine build on this one. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's last I might have typed that in before. I had no idea. Yeah. Hmm. All right, so you know what? As, as we're waiting for my machine to boot, we'll do a commercial, right? Um, <clears throat> who's this week's sponsor? This week's sponsor is, uh, I, do, I normally do Kraft, um, America's favorite cheese. It's a horrible cheese. Um, all right, so I told you there was three classes, one, two, three. Yeah. Here's the third class. Now I wanna show you something. Um, it's all in Visual Studio. 2022 and 
as this thing boots up. Somebody. And here's, here's projects, tiny GLTF, shaders, XML, protocol buffers, proto interface, math, file, and then the converter, right? And the converter then has a ton of other stuff, right? And so we go through all that, and now it's gonna actually uh, compile all these projects at once. And you can see them happening in parallel here, and the numbers are different numbers. And what these things are gonna do is gonna read raw assets. And so now it's going to do the conversion. So right here is about uh, five, five different projects, you know, three different libraries all being put together. And it's converting all these assets. So it's where textures and animations and skin and models. And it's all converting it into a protocol buffer. Right? And then that stuff outputs um, to this data file here. And so this is a temporary directory that's been created with all the converted assets. And then now we have converted assets. And so now we turn around and build the engine. So the engine has these you know, additional six, seven libraries. And so you can see here's library for time, for shaders for the, um, the back plane for the graphics, protocol, trees, math, managers, um, another uh, graphical display engine, and then a file system. And then the engine itself, which is boom, just tons and tons and tons and tons and tons. And what this is gonna do is compile, you know, these, these seven more projects, interlink those, load up the shaders, and it's gonna take the graphics rendering, load it up in real time, and then shoot it to the, to the graphics shader. And it's gonna spin up a thousand processors. Those thousand processors will be working in parallel and it will render the objects. And so this class isn't about rendering, it's about <coughs> a real time. So here's, oh, hey. So, uh, hey. so here, this is, uh, I think 40,000 polys, the R2s. Um, and then that's a skin model and each vertice is actually blended between four different bones with different weights. So that's rigged right there. Um, rigged meaning what? As in like it's got like a skeleton. It's got bones. It's got bones. Yeah, bone skin, bone deal, animated bones. We're doing a motion capture. Okay. Uh, data on it. So and then the mesh is also interacting with those bones mm -hmm. right yeah. then and there. Okay. And that's all in the GPUs. Okay, cool. You can't possibly do that in the CPUs anymore. Um, all right, so there's that one, right? And that that's cute, but. Um, So this is the third class, just to show you, to give you guys a carrot. And now I can by time couple of this. Um, so something failed. I see Gangnam Star. <laughs> what? I'm just yeah. reading. <laughs> Not seeing a pop dance here. Not seeing oh, a lot of stuff. <coughs> <coughs> Debug mode. Right. Um, it does debug mode doesn't matter in this case or do heavy IO. All right, so there's that converting. So now this whole mess created a lot more data, right? And now, here it is. So now,
So these are each one animating a different model. So it's this fully separate instance of everything. So um, there, the thousand processors are just kind of daisy chain between each model. So anyway, all right. Now I got that. So I have to ask, who did the motion capture for all of this? This is this is off of Adobe website. The one file that didn't come through. It's always the case, right? All right. Um, there we go. Right date. Cool. All right. Can't take that for you. <clears throat> All right, so, um, all right, here we go, yeah. All right, so the, uh, obviously the meeting's uh, in person. If you can attend, please attend. We have still more space. If you know, other people can squeeze in here, it's totally fine. Um, I have an email, just use it for emergency. I, I literally get six or 7,000 emails a day. So it, it's just, piazza is better. Um, all right, there's my room. Phone number is completely useless. That's 1980s technology. All right. Um, Zoom. So office hours. I have a half an hour um, in person today before, um, before the class. And then I try to get in here earlier and be also in the class for additional office hours. But then we have also online on Monday night office hours by Zoom. And the reason for that is a lot of students are, are working or just their schedule doesn't necessarily fit. So um, we do it on Monday nights. Okay. Uh, just use um, PIAZ as much as possible, right? All right, so philosophy of this course is the only way I can have you learn real-time software development is to do a project, to do something large, to do something that is going to push you in those envelopes, right? The stuff we're going to be doing is going to be somewhat game or graphics related just because that's the thing that's going to chew through a lot of data, right? It's not necessarily about game development. It's more about uh, just the real-time aspects of it. The one thing we're gonna do is you can work in groups, but all the projects are individually done. Uh, the reason for that is if you work in groups, you know, Jill always does networking and Mike never does networking. Every class, Jill does networking. She's really good at networking. Mike never seen networking. So when he goes to interview, they ask him a networking question and he thinks he knows it, but actually Jill did it the whole time. And now uh, Mike doesn't get the job, right? <laughs> So individual uh, work really helps you clarify your weakness, right? And I'm there to help you bring up on this. Uh, this class, as you can see, some of the um, final projects, you know, you have a lot of latitude to kind of be creative and do more things with it. And a lot of people show off and do this stuff. These are the things that you can show off to people in industry because most people haven't done this stuff. Even the people you're interviewing probably haven't done a lot of this stuff. So it's kind of some, some cool stuff, right? All right. Real-time software development. I had a lot of students last year who went through all of these three courses and some of my other courses finished getting insanely good jobs. Um, starting at 170,000 with zero experience. Companies aren't generous. They hate giving money out, but they have to give good money out to be able to do hard problems because they can't find other people. The problem that you guys will have if you go through all these courses is that um, you'll have a lot more experience than your years, say. And so it will take a little bit of interviewing to get to the right company who appreciates what you're doing because you're so far ahead of someone with five years, 10 years experience. And you have, you know, no years experience or very little. Um, but you just have to find the right companies that, that have hardcore stuff. Good, good, strong companies want strong programmers. And um, they're in demand. And this is the only, only, only security you can have in, in your uh, programming or technical career is your ability to do hard problems. You know, even if you, unless you work at your, your parents' company and you're a relative or something, you married in or did something like that, there almost is no security in tech field um, because companies get gobbled, they fall apart, they lay off certain stuff, stuff, but people who are good never are unemployed. And every time they switch jobs, they go up in price, right? I got mad at my company one day and just 
squabble in a room like going F you and I took a mental holiday the next day, I got three job offers. And I was just like, I'm mad. Let me call these three people. I went in to talk with them, this bullshit and drink. And I got three offers that day. So that's where you want to be. You want to be in the point where you do this. So then I came back. I still stayed at Midway. But then I was going to take no crap, <laughs> you know, because I had, I had already had landing pads set up for me. So that's where I want you guys to be, right? Real-time software development is useful. Um, it's actually being more useful in almost every single field now because people want responsive reactions, right? You know, the days of computer science where it's like, it works, good job, and you pat yourself on the back are over. Um, that's the assumption. Real time is I want it fast. I want to be efficient. I want to be able to do more on my device. Um, I'm seeing this in high frequency trading, banking, image processing, uh, avionics, games, um, you name it, physics simulations, everything is starting to use it these days. It's, it's actually quite amazing. All right, so I'm your guide. Um, so it's, this is a journey, we're gonna go up the mountain, but as we all know, and we all read our, our um, mountain climbing books, most people die on the way down from a mountain, right? So just getting up to the peak is cool. You can take that photograph, but then later somebody will find your body with a really nice camera in your pocket saying, look, I was at the summit, but I'm dead, you know? So my goal is to group, bring you up and bring you back down safely, right? And in doing that, I'm going to pull you back sometimes. You're gonna be overly aggressive and overly optimistic. Like, wow, I did this, now I wanna do this, right? Or like, I, I was in Optimize and I learned about this hammer. This hammer is called SIMD. Isn't that the best hammer in the world? And you're like, oh, Eddie has this math uh, library. I'm gonna do the whole thing in SIMD. I'm gonna pull you back <laughs> and say, don't do that because you're gonna use all your oxygen now. And when we get up to high altitude, you need that oxygen, you don't have anything left, right? So these are good exercises to add later, right? After the quarter, some people actually take a problem here. We're gonna come through a lot of different unique problems and they've done research projects with me just on that one problem. Um, so don't, I'm gonna pull you back so you don't do overcommit, right? So here's the syllabus um, statement, blah, blah, blah. It's huge, right? We're doing runtime, libraries, low level, abstraction, day containers, memory tracking, um, you know, drivers, align allocations, data-driven messaging. Um, so many <coughs> different things are happening here, right? So let's look at this a little more. The prereqs for this course is Optimize C++. You should know C++ pretty well, pretty solid. If you're a little weak in areas, it will get short up just by nature of using it more. So it's kind of like the more you practice, the better you get at it. So it's really funny. My wife used to follow figure skating when, 20 years ago. And we, I used to get dragged to all these figure skating competitions. And I'm like, oh, I saw that guy in the Olympics. I saw this guy in the Olympics. Like, he's much better now. She's much better now, right? Well, guess what? When you get paid to be a professional skater and you have to be doing your A game twice a night, matinee and, and the evening show, you get really good. When you're an amateur, you would like work up two weeks to do that one show for that one day. And then you go back and you retrain again. You work up for two weeks and do it and you try to peak for the Olympics. But professionals do it twice a day and they get really good, right? And that's the same thing is with, with, with the software development. You, you kind of like, okay, okay, I learned, I just barely learned how to do this. Well, if you start using it every day, you get a thousand times better and it doesn't become any, any struggles at all. You just, you start knowing how to do this correctly. We're gonna be doing a lot, uh, some common patterns, not all of them, but pattern here and there. We're gonna be uh, doing some high speed, high performance uh, file systems and memory systems. So we're gonna be understanding a little more about caches and how does the data work underneath the hood. Um, what's interesting to me right now is by using, we wrote our own memory system, right? Before for Optimize or in systems, some people do that in systems as well. Uh, we're not gonna use, we're not gonna write our own. We're gonna use Microsoft's Win32 memory system. And that's much lower level than what we had before. And we're gonna build our system on top of those things. So like right now, if you're on your, your, your iPhone, your iPhone has an iOS kernel and the iOS kernel has its own memory system. That's gonna be faster than calling general new or delete or malloc and free. If 
by calling their operating system. The problem is people don't use it. It's there. They don't use it because they're afraid to do the abstraction. <coughs> the, everybody's interface is slightly different. We're gonna learn how to understand the abstraction, wrap it and use it in our way. So there's a lot of things that are there. It's kind of like having your car. And if your car has a sport mode or a, a manual mode, and you don't use it. You're not gonna get the most out of that car, right? Um, all right. <coughs> Textbook is going to be, uh, textbook is really, they're really, I was going to say, there's really not an official textbook. If you want to go deeper into these problems, this is a book that kind of starts you off in this. I know this is like you know, 900 to I don't know, 1200 pages, I forgot what it is. I worked with this guy before, and he's uh, one of the engineers at Naughty Dog. Um, I'm going to hold judgment because I, I did work with him for 10 years. So, um, there's things in here that are good, and things in here that are arm waving. And one of the problems I have with any book is they give you spoon fed chapter to chapter and section to section on the easy stuff. But when the real stuff comes, they arm wave and they don't never give you the details. And that, that really frustrates me because I can figure out the easy stuff. I can look at 17 books that have the same intro chapters. I want the, the, the meat, the hard part, right? I want somebody to sit there and give me guidance. And that's what's missing out of this book as well. So this gives you the high level stuff, but doesn't give you the low level, here's how it really works. And then partially that's also because of trade secrets. So um, surprise, surprise, academics is late to technology. If you read a book, the book is 15 years old. Published yesterday, it's 15 years technology old. The latest stuff is in journals, that's five years old. Papers, topic papers, are two to three years old, right? So by the time it goes from a couple of papers to journals, collection to a book, you have a 10 year cycle before it gets into a book, right? Now, I worked in industry for a lot of years and I know other people who work in industry. We did really cool stuff and we weren't allowed to publish a lick of it because that's our trade secrets. And you know the company paid you real money to develop this stuff they're not paying you to share it to our competitors. So um, the reason why I say that is a lot of material we're going to go through isn't necessarily in books. I'm going to kind of cover it, give you slides. We're going to do exercises with it. And I'll give you kind of, here's 10 different references of pieces of it, but we're going to be kind of putting together in this class. So the, the reference material is going to be a little more spotty, you know, a little more like optimized, where you kind of find the pieces there, but um, that's the why. Right. All right. As of 10 a.m. this morning, uh, we were going to use OpenGL. And here's what it is. I hate Apple. I hate Mac. I hate Apple. I hate Mac. Um, so here's, here's, my, here's my beef about this. When I came here from industry, I, I came in here and was like, oh, we're going to teach on DirectX. They're like going, well, we're using open GL in, in academia because it's, it's universal. It works in everybody, right? So then I started teaching iPhone development in that was in open GL. Uh -huh. So I bought a Mac teaching open GL and all of our classes were in open GL. Apple, after Jobs died, decided that they're gonna do a couple things. They're gonna make their own chipset and they're gonna make their own competitive uh, graphics metal. solution metal. And what they did is, they used to have the Intel processor. So you used to be able to dual boot from uh, Mac OS to literally a true boot on an, on an Intel processor to a Windows machine. Then they came up with their own processor, the M processors. And so now you can't do dual booting. You can't do a true boot camp. So you do this thing called emulation. So you use parallels or there's a couple other uh, ones there. And it's worked pretty good. And I found out today by a student online, he, he's like, I got this new computer and it says OpenGL 3.3 compatible, which is a state-of-the-art 15-year-old interface. But his same computer runs on DirectX 11.4, right? So he has beautiful hardware and Apple is screwing <coughs> Mac users from using OpenGL. And uh, I was teaching before on uh, Vulkan, the same thing happened. 
that uh, they stopped Vulcan production because it was competitive against metal. So they even went furthermore, they actually remove functionality from their, their chips on this. All right, so what does that mean to you guys? Not a damn thing, right? All it means is when we start graphics portion in five or six weeks, I'm going to have every, we're gonna probably go on to DirectX, which is fine because you know it works. It works even on Macs and with emulation mode. So it works on everything. I just have a lot of work to do between now and then just to, to change the whole three courses into uh, DirectX. So, um, so yeah, it was bound to happen at some point. Um, I got my cussing out of the way. I was just screaming left and right and throwing things. Um, so when we talk about the, uh, the first kind of mini um, environment assignment, I want you to look at what is your OpenGL level and what is your DirectX level? And this way I can make sure that we're all compatible with that, which I think we will be. Have you, have you posted instructions on checking DirectX level? It's the same tool. It just it reports it. Oh. Yeah, it's just a little, little, bit, little bit down. It says yeah, DirectX. Yeah. Okay. So, um, which is actually probably okay because DirectX, OpenGL is um, a looser standard. It's not as strict and not as um, compile time safe. There's a lot of casting in OpenGL. DirectX has a lot more type safety. Doesn't matter because your, your, um, your PC has a graphics card. I, I'm drawing it because it's over here. And um, the graphics card, if you're talking in DirectX, you send data to that card. Or if you <coughs> don't kill, you send data to the same card. So the data is the same. It's just what is your interface to the data? So there's a little different setup, but at the end of the day, the same bytes that get marshaled to the chip are the same. So that's why they're fairly compatible between the two. What about in your Why would I want to like encourage? Uh, if you want to do metal, you do it as a research project. All right. <laughs> We're going to go into low level uh, Windows programming. Um, this book here, this is Windows System Programming. It's kind of old, but it has the internals of the stuff. There's a really good link online that has all this material in there. Also, it has all the functionality online as well. And we're going to be writing our own memory system and file system using that. Um, in the future, if you wanted to, you can even do threading system. And, and um, these things call, you, know, you have threads, right? But one thread is made up of many fibers. So they actually also have fibers as well. This is a magic book. All right. And obviously, everything being in C++, don't worry. Um, we're not going to go down the template route. Templates, partial specialization, and all the crazy template stuff that people just love to use, I, I think are really inefficient because it's hard to optimize that stuff. Secondly, almost impossible to debug. When you mistype a template stuff, it throws the most obscure, you know, like, you know, like report you know, errors that, that you can imagine. Um, so we're going to stay away from this, uh, opt, um, uh, template programming. The only time templates are kind of useful are for containers. But um, again, containers, you can shoot yourself in the foot very easily with containers. Um, you can use them incorrectly. So we're going to be doing a lot of our stuff our own. But we might prototype with templates, containers. So like, let's say we needed to manage a lot of objects. We might throw it into an STL list or an STL vector temporarily to develop, then turn around and replace it, if that makes sense. All right, some systems we're going to be doing. We're going to do our own memory system from scratch, file system, object system, which we'll talk about today, math library. Um, what's interesting is the math library we do is it's more about interfaces, how to make really smart interfaces. Um, to get our performance there. What's funny is a couple students have done research with me and they're doing um, iOS, Android development, even the third party uh, game engines. And I yelled at them because I'm like, going, you made a math library in this class. Why aren't you using the math library? Well, you know, this was already there. This, you know, they were lazy. They used what was given to them. They replaced it. And ours was three times faster than theirs in C++, not in Cindy. So just writing more intelligent interfaces in the way we're going to do this will make the code really fast and really uh, wide. 
All right, uh, we'll get into some other things kind of like as we're dealing with this stuff. So the first half of the class was the first uh, four or five libraries we're making, we're making standalone libraries from scratch. Then we're gonna take all those libraries together and put it together in an application, um, a, uh, a primitive game engine, a graphics drawing engine. And um, you need to know zero about graphics to make this happen. Um, and we'll kind of walk you through that stuff. So. All right, so here's the syllabus. Are we making it uh, cross-platform compatible or it's just Windows? This is just Windows. <clears throat> Especially if it's DX. It, it, DX guarantees it's Windows. All right. Um, All right, so here's the syllabus. Um, uh, you know, we, um, yeah, there's the in person for uh, 430 to 5, and then also back into class. Um, and then Monday remote. Um, here's the lecture. Here's the, the thing here. Here's all about 100,000 lines of code. Somebody saw that and kind of freaked out. No, it's about 100,000. All right. Um, here's, here's a project, and it's, it's pretty straightforward. The first five PAs are just making libraries. So every week is a new library. We just keep working on the library. The uh, memory system, surprise, is pretty large and complicated. So it's, it's a two week system. We just break it up in part A, part B. Is that just like 461 pretty not much? Not even close, not even close. <laughs> like, nothing, you say that, what do you mean? Like not close. Like you, you will not write Malik, you will not write free. Okay. It's harder than that or? I, it's, well, this like you're making a memory system that has multiple heaps. Okay. <clears throat> and each heap will have individual tracking. So if you stop your program and say, how many, what are all the allocations associated to, to textures? Here, you get a list of it. When you free up your textures, which ones are still hanging around? Here's the list of those that are laying, hanging around. You close your program, you're leaking. Which files are you leaking? Which line number, which file numbers are? Which alignment? You have arbitrary alignment on every allocation. You have multiple heaps. So it's, it's only called memory system just because the word is memory. There's nothing really proportional to what we did in Optimize. Hmm. Right. But it's needed for real time. All right. Um, so we, we're doing an object system today. We're doing a memory system. These two are swapped around. We're actually going to do the math system next week, and then the memory follows after that. We're going to do a file system from scratch um, using Win32, and then we're going to add iterators to our tree. Our big project is to make a graphics object, uh, graphics engine um, associated with this. And it'd be like a little step on the way. And our essay, our essay is throughout each of these assignments, I give you a different software engineering technique. And what you're going to do is just write a four page paper on compare and contrast those techniques. So it's a, it's a reflection paper. It's not a, it's not a, you know, correct or wrong, incorrect. So some of the things we're going to do, um, test driven development, iterative development, you know, uh, uh, exploratory prototyping, stuff like that. <coughs> And these are the skill sets that you're going to use when you're doing a software architecture. All right, so here's the books. We're doing everything. I shoot. I need to correct that. We're doing everything in 2022. Um, and what will happen is I'm going to give you the projects that are going to work in 2022. Um, the it seems to be pretty stable now. And uh, if you've read the uh, Piazza post, I told you kind of what they did here at the Poly. They, installed 2022, but with uh, 2019 with the 2022 libraries and they kind of crisscrossed these things. So it didn't, wasn't really consistent. And when I, we discovered it, they're like going, well, we're not gonna re-image all 300 computers throughout the university with the correct version. So that's why it took me a while to kind of figure this out. So we're gonna be now in 2022. You can use newer stuff, but stay in 2022. Um, and then the verification will make sure you're in a compatible version of it. All right, um, I went through this. So the first four, uh, five systems are just libraries. And then we do the engine. Then we do a progression video. And then the essay, which is basically a reflection. 
So it's mostly the grades are mostly with it's the all assignments. Code. Yeah, not code. the final. Yeah, the final is ten percent, but everything's code. And the final is reflection, unless yeah. you, I don't, don't write with complete sentences. I think you'll get full credit. Um, but um, anyway, all right. So uh, Perforce Piazza, um, please. I encourage people to work together um, and bounce ideas with each other. Piazza is going to be only as good as people participating in it. Um, some people last quarter, and especially in um, engine and engine um, space meters and in optimized, asked a lot of questions and got a good dialogue going on. Um, the problem right now is with Discord; it's too free form. People tend to do, use that stuff, but. I have seen historically uh -huh. people who, who are heavy on Discord actually correlate, don't do as well as people who participate more on Piazza. Um, so I got data for that for, for 10 years worth. So please, not 10, seven, I guess. Um, please use Piazza and ask questions there. This way we can sit there and put a code snippet, code problem, and we can have a lot of discussion just on that code snippet. And then now, if you're the first one there, you can you're, you're pioneering. But if somebody comes in there a week later, it's still there and it's it's very easily searchable. So please use that. Uh, we cannot leak memory. That's going to be the Russell we're going to have to deal with. Um, everything you're running, we were going to run both in debug and release. I did in the past, uh, two years ago and, and earlier, where I had everything built in x86 and 64-bit mode. Uh, I'll leave it up to you guys, but I didn't think it was a good return uh, because it's meant you have to build four different variant variances. When you do your data structures, you have to deal with pointers are 32 bits or pointers are 64 bits, which jacks your whole alignment. So you have to have now two data structures per build and, and your alignment issues comes with that. You have to use size T a lot more. So I'm kind of drifting away from doing the dual uh, build on that for 64-bit and 32-bit mode, but if you want to, we can talk about that or even do a mini exercise on that. But I don't think it's a good return. Yes. Is there like a consistent, safe way to write so that we can, it's like the same code can work for both cases where it's like general enough to like, oh, I need you to go read how long the word is and make yourself fit that or is? No, no, it's literally, you have two data structures with a pound defined, which when you- Oh, I see. In. And the problem is the alignment changes. Right. Because once you add, Couple integers and a couple of floats, and then you, then then you add uh, a pointer. Then the pointer is sixty-four bit and just jacks your whole alignment out. So you have to add more dead space, more padding. Or just put it at the front. Um, you think that's the way, but no. Okay. Yeah, it, it becomes much more problematic. Just add a V table, right, to a class. You just no, you didn't add thirty-two. You added sixty-four. You compile in in, in thirty-two bit mode. Now you added thirty-two bits. File 64 bit and a 64 bit V table, which jacks your whole alignment. So, um, but I'll, you know what? If you guys are interested, we will, I'll give you a presentation on just the nuances of your writing this code, how, you, how to do this. Um, all right, do not cheat or you fail. That's it. All right, so here's the exercises you can see every week someone's due. So I'll tell you the, 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 how I wanted to do this class, but how I'm not going to do this class. In the past, I wanted to sit there and treat everybody as professionals saying, in six weeks, all this stuff is due. And so every PA is due in six weeks. Um, and then, you know, it just becomes a great fest. The uh, catch is every time I did that, the hard stuff people didn't do, didn't do, didn't do, and then it's like, because eight weeks, nine weeks, and then meanwhile, the, the application doesn't get started, and then they're going to roll the pain. So um, based off historical behavior, we're going to have things due every week, just to kind of keep it going. But once we get into the project, then it'll be a couple of weeks on your own, and then a, a snapshot, then a couple of weeks to finish. <clears throat> that makes sense. The weekly things that keep you online, right? Um, all right, that is the syllabus. All right, so the whole idea is that I'm trying to help you become architects and you got to start thinking differently. Um, it's easy to keep asking questions, do I do this or do this? Or tell me what I need. 
when we're doing these libraries, the only requirement is it, it matches <coughs> the interface. Because that's for the, the testing. If there's, if there's test involved, it matches the interface. How you get there is really up to you. There's a lot of different ways. So the first so many assignments are pretty rigorous, but after that, it becomes much more, you have a lot of more rope to hang yourself with or to make mistakes. Um, don't be married to your code. You're going to delete a lot of your code. You might get to a certain point and then this whole thing falls apart. That's good experience. You know, did I ever tell you the, the engineering story where the guy screwed up a $2 million project? So he works on this project for a year, you know, engineer. And uh, he has, you know, five or six other people work on, works on this project and the project goes belly up. And, uh, you know, he starts packing up his stuff in his room and putting it in boxes and the boss walks by and goes, why are you packing your stuff up? He goes, look, I just screwed up a $2 million project. We have a year of work and nothing to show for it. Yeah, I'm gonna get fired, so I'm gonna sleep now. He goes, why the hell are you leaving? I just spent $2 million on your education. Now you have that experience, so let's, let's now get our money back. And that's the whole purpose of when you write code and you throw it away, it's not bad code. You're knowing what not to do. You're gaining a lot more experience. And that's a hard thing to comprehend, but you guys have it so much easier because you're writing in a high level language, C++. Imagine when you spend two months writing machine code and the machine code doesn't work correctly or it doesn't answer the problem you're trying to solve and you're deleting two months worth of machine code, right? And it takes you every, everything just to get it to work. Then it doesn't work in the power problem you're solving. That's really painful. So deleting C++ code is easy. I can rewrite that again very quickly. Writing machine code sucks. So, all right, you are an architect, and I just like this. This is a Commodore VIC-20. Hey, Ed, quick question. Yes. Back to the to the book topic. We're not going to do OpenGL, so are you going to post a DirectX book then? Or yeah, there's a couple expect? DirectX books. The good news about anything Microsoft does, everything is designed to be online as well. So there'll be the whole suite of material also online by Microsoft. So Microsoft's really good by having redundant information. So well, I'll give you a book, I'll give you a good reference that's online, we can look at. Um, but how we're gonna do the graphics is a little bit different. We're gonna do the iterative development and how this is gonna work is you're gonna put one thing on the screen and we're gonna keep modifying it, modifying, modifying it into what we want. So in OpenGL, we would do this. Um, So let's pretend it's OpenGL right now. I'm still debating on switching to DirectX. I think I'm going to just because it makes more sense. I saw welcome somewhere. What? I saw welcome written up there somewhere. That's nice. You're kidding me. Just a fragment, you could probably just- No, that means mine. Mine at home is newer than this one. So I was getting errors at the one at home and not the errors here. All right, so this, this project here, week six, this is what we started out with. Probably be direct text, but same, same idea. We start off with a working demo, right? And this working demo is one file. That's it. And all we're gonna do now is Dissect this file, start separating it, making more files, making moving the library out here, moving the data here, adding this, adding the math, and replacing it. And literally every every step we'll be doing five or six mini steps to get there. Every week we'll do five or six mini steps. And in four weeks, it's gonna look nothing like this, and this will be huge and large. So we're not doing graphics from scratch. Like here's the book, good luck. We're we're saying. <laughs> Here's a demo. We're going to iterate and refactor it and add structure to it and in order to it. And that technique is a way to get going a lot faster than you can ever do from scratch. If, if somebody gave you a direct textbook, say, here, program from scratch, you get no sample code, you'd be banging your head for, for, for quite a while trying to learn that material and trying to figure out how it works. But if I sit there and say, this works today, keep it working. 
you would then say, you know, I'm going to replace it with my memory system. I'm going to replace and add my file system. I'm going to add my math system. Oh, you know what? We're moving data here. Now let's make a manager to organize that data. Now let's shuttle it this way. And slowly and steadily, it looks then like an engine. So that's the approach. So, so for the direct X, same thing's going to be. I'm going to start off with one mini project that's working. We'll just evolve it out. And as we evolve and we're touching something, that's when we look up and say, what is this really doing? How does this really work? Right. So it's a little different approach. Does that make sense? Yep, thanks. Um, all right. Um, all right, so, all right, yeah, cool. All right, so let me go through um, a quick lecture here on architecture design. How do we design architecture and how we look at things, right? And one of the problems is when we do software development, this is, I don't know if you know the stats, virtually every single project that's working in an industry is late. Right? Um, but it was interesting. So you go to, to a car company, you know, pick your car company, you know, Fiat, Ford, you know, Volkswagen, you know, Hyundai, whatever, and they're gonna make a new car. Well, they made other cars before, right? And they're like going, yeah, we're going to do a new engine. Okay, they made other engines before. Then why does it take 10 years? Right? Why does it take, you know, an accelerated route, you know, they, they can maybe make an engine in five years. Well, why does it take five years? They've done, how many engines have, the, you know, Mazda made before? A lot. Why does it still take them five years to make this out, right? And there are small changes to what we had before. That's all this takes this long to do something you know. Software, you're running stuff that you've never done before. That's why almost every project is late. It's because you don't know how to deal with the unknown. You don't have, you haven't worked with someone before. And, um, you know, very rarely do you get a time to do a, a problem a second time. Like, make, make a second um, uh, math library. Make a second, you know, uh, file system. Very rarely do you get a time to do it again. You normally take an existing code and adding to it or writing it from scratch. Um, and because of that unknown is why you're almost always late. So there's some techniques to kind of help us design an architect a little bit better, I think, right? So there's this principle called the dry principle, right? And it's don't repeat yourself. It's really a simple principle, but what you need to do is have one location that holds your data or holds your function. I'll give an example. On large projects, somebody has to write a min-max function. And if you Google on a large project, you might see 20 locations where there's that same min-max function, but 20 different ways. You know, and it's like, well, why don't you just call that one? Well, the programmer probably didn't know about it, or they didn't write it. And that becomes a problem. So now there's two problems. So now let's say you're doing some kind of math operations or trying to find um, the bounding volume of something. If you find the bounding volume in this function here and you find in this one here, and let's say there's a mistake, you gotta fix it in two locations. Well, you fix it in one and part of your code base has gone through the one, but the other one nobody fixed. Now you have uh, sharing and skewing of data. So we wanna have one location and everything drives into that one location. By forcing that, that's gonna force you to reuse things, right? Um, so it's just a very simple concept. Don't repeat yourself, have one and only one location. It reduces the need for duplication. Also has a very nice maintainability is if you optimize it, everybody gets optimized who uses it. If there's a bug, you fix it in one location and everybody gets the benefit of the bug fix, right? Make your systems easier to use, right? And here's, here's kind of the weird thing. You, people, will not, uh, people will not use code they don't understand, right? So make, make it easy to understand. Don't have very small, minimal interface. Don't give people five options. Nothing's more annoying than when you go to McDonald's and the you know, family's in front of you, it's like, goes to little Jimmy, what do you want? I don't know. And there's all these options like, you know, like be the parent and say, you're getting the happy meal number two, shut up, here it is, right? But no, they give them the, the affordance stuff, they have choices. 
too many choices slows things down. Too many choices, you kind of get options there. Then also too many choices give you more opportunity to make mistakes, right? So give people one way to use your system and only one way, it narrows down their choices, narrows down your testing, makes your code more reliable, right? So how, how does the code get reused? Use it, show an example of it, make the names you know, very, very explanatory. People generally will not read you know, external documentation. They'll read documentation that's next to it, sitting above it sometimes, sometimes. Um, but a lot of times they'll just kind of infer by how it's being used or by its naming convention, right? Um, if you have something written in a library and then you're calling that library and using it, you tend not to change that code because it's kind of in a plastic box. So as soon as we get stuff stabilized, put it in a library. Then it slows you down. You know, I remember I had a memory system in Midway Games for NFL Blitz game. And, you know, it was just, here's some memory files in the middle of the game, right? And I'm looking through the, the Malik and I see if the Pistons are down by 10, do this. I'm like, why is this in Malik? Why is there a, a thing about the, the, the basketball team, or I'm sorry, this is basketball. Um, why, why is there a thing about the, the Detroit basketball team in the middle of my Malik? So every time you do Malik, it's checking the, the score, right? And that's because it was there, some programmer didn't know what they were doing. They put a breakpoint like going, well, I'm always in Malik. I was putting my check <laughs> in Malik, you know, and they put their AI in that Malik, right? But if I would have had that in a library, the, the programmer wouldn't know how to build a library, wouldn't get in there and it'd be a little more encapsulated. So libraries are good. Jeez. So what's nice is, you know, if it's shared, everybody starts to know it, they can help each other out. So you have the transfer knowledge, that's a big problem here. If you fix the bug, it fixes it in multiple locations. If you speed it up, it feeds speed up multiple locations. So the shared code base really starts to give you dividends, right? Crash early and crash often, right? Do not limp around. You want, if you have a mistake, you want to throw an assert right there and then. You want it to throw an exception right there and then. You want it to crash. Do not limp on, right? I'll give you an example of this. Um, we were doing a cross product with two cross products to find the vector up for um, a ship that's flying around a 3D tr track. And once in a while, one of the input vectors come in as zeros. And well, if you cross something with a zero, you, you get an, a, a zero vector and it has no magnitude. So it can't be normalized. So a bad input vector came in there, it was zero. And uh, some programmer discovered it. And what they did is instead of stopping, putting in a, a cert, fixing what, what, who's feeding you bad data, they just said, return Y up, right? So now the game's going on and the airplane's flying, also it just tips over, flies upside down and goes right back, right? It took me four months to find that bug because it was an underflow on an exception of a negative multiply under accumulate exception that was handled incorrectly. And when I found the mistake, I wanted to kill the guy because I'm like going, who in the right mind? Because like it would crash, I get this much stack and I would just keep waiting until it crashed. Somebody grabbed me, I come in there and get this much more stack and I put a little more code in there. And four months eventually I found out it was because of this light up. <coughs> So solution, assert, throw an assert, throw an exception, stop, fix the problem instead of limping on. Don't let it kind of go on. Um, so the Tiger story, um, there was a, they're making a train. I think this is like um, way back in the day when they're making trains in India. Uh, the, tr the workers on India uh, would sleep and live next to the train site where they're actually doing everything by hand. And you know, sure enough, someone went out away from their tent at night and got eaten by a tiger. So they go, holy crap, tiger just ate a person. Let's go get the tiger. So everybody grabs their guns and fire sticks and stuff like that, chase after her. And the first tiger they see, they shoot the crap out of it and kill the tiger. Well, a week and a half later, two weeks later, another guy gets picked off <laughs> and gets eaten, <laughs> right? And so they're running around, gonna shoot at the next tiger they, they see, right? And somebody finally said, you know what, stop. 
let's not let's make sure we get the right tiger so when we get the tiger let's make sure there's a piece of the guy's arm in his, in his belly or something like that and we know we killed the right tiger right the analogy is when you debug your code you change something like oh the bug's gone that's coincidental you just shot a tiger it may not be the tiger that caused the trouble right make sure you find the right one make sure you see that this what i always try to do is when i have a bug write an assert that shows the bug crashing, fix the bug, <laughs> then the search should never get called again, right? So those first solution when you find a bug, don't fix it, add testing, then now when you fix it, you, don't, you should never get bit by the same bug twice, right? Or finality, keep your libraries and your systems isolated and decoupled from each other. You wanna optimize one system but you don't want it to affect the other system, right? Your UI should not affect your physics, <laughs> right? I'm joking, but that's how Unreal works. It's kind of that's right? Sadly to say, that's how I found code in Unreal. Like, why is physics inside of the UI? <laughs> and then they had the, the guts to say uh, at a GDC conference that they were gonna talk on orthogonality. So I'm like, oh, I pay money just to go in there and heckle them. Um, so keep them decoupled. The more you can keep them decoupled, the more you can swap things out. So if you have your file library in one location and you're calling everything to, the, to that one location, you can swap that out with a different file library and you can see if it runs faster or not. All right. Um, orthogonality actually has a, a secondary effect. When you start working on teams of, of more than one, if, if your files are large and they're doing a lot of different functionality, you'll be in the same code base by two, three, four people. And now you're stepping on each other's toes and you have to do merging issues and, and um, resolve conflicts. By keeping them more separated, you're like, oh, you work on this, system, I work on this system. This way you kind of work with autonomy and isolation on your, by yourself. So from a working standpoint, um, orthogonality helps as well. Design your code into layers, right? And so layers, you can control the accessing and, and, and um, you can kind of have rules of how you can communicate the layers. So layer system is what we're gonna use in this class as we get in larger systems. And here, here's the diagram on the right is the condensed diagram. And then what it means is on the left here. And what we can see here is that um, B can talk directly to D, C can talk to this. Anybody can talk to anything on that line and A has you know, it can go to all these different levels. And the reason for this is you can start to talk to your hardware and have kind of the whole concept of rings of, of um, um, permissions, right? Like, I'm not gonna talk to the hardware, I'll have a hardware abstraction layer talk to it. Now I just talk to that layer. Well, maybe my math library talks to you, then we're like, oh, a collision library talks to the math library. And the physics library talks to the collision library. And now the physics library actually propagates from all the way down to the lowest level, but it doesn't need to know about the lowest level. You know, it's kind of like you kick the can, you give it to somebody else and you delegate it and they're responsible to take it to the next level. And that keeps your code simpler and, and a little cleaner. So this is layering. And this is really a nice, nice technique and we'll be using that. All right, so some so summary, you know, keep your code decoupled, avoid using global data and abstract similar uh, systems. Don't speculate designs, right? So uh, in the future, you want to have, I think somebody said, are we going to do cross-platform? Yeah. Speculation, right? What's required today? Windows. La, 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 every other system, ignore it. Because whatever you think you're going to do today, you're wrong, <clears throat> right? You are making executive decisions and adding complications to your design today until that requirement's in your hand, until a customer's asking for that requirement, you don't do that requirement. Um, because if your code is smaller, leaner, it fulfills the requirement faster. Also, you don't know what the requirement is yet until it's literally at your doorstep yelling at you and I need this extra feature, don't put the feature in. Um, if you're design, you're worried about, but, but because I didn't design for multi, uh, was it? Cross-platform. 
Cross-platform. Cross-platform, because I didn't design for cross-platform. Yeah. I'm screwed because now when I need to add uh, Mac OS, right? I don't have it designed for Mac OS. Well, the question here is start designing right now for Mac OS, right? In Unix, right? And ARM, right? And, and Adreno, right? Yeah. Do that today. I guarantee you, no matter how you do it, it's wrong because you don't have the requirements in your hand. So you're going to add layers and complexities and all this stuff. And that requirement may never, nobody, nobody may, uh, the requirement may never come to your doorstep. You may never, never have to implement that. And now you burn your whole system. So I'll give an example of this. This one student, uh, not student, this one coworker of mine was working on PlayStation 2. PlayStation 2 had a, um, a memory card. You know, so he's going to write a, a file system for the memory card. And he goes, oh, you know, we can also hook up a COM interface to it, and we can hook up, you know, different drives, and we can, you know, put him into a network cable and have it interface to this, so, you know, using the same port and all this sort of stuff. So he did this whole COM interface. And, uh, well, he got it working, and now just reading and writing to the file was super slow because you had to do the arbitration between the common interfaces, right? And his whole grandiose idea that everybody's going to use this and everybody can use, you know, it can be extended, never came about because nobody needed it. So now all he did is he slowed down today's requirement. So um, I yanked that off him, gave it to an intern and said, hey, just follow the demo and just write directly to and from the, the, the drive. And it got it working in three days and it was like 10 times faster. So don't speculate, refactor, right? All right, prototypes. We're gonna prototype, and the whole idea of a prototype is just to learn. Um, it's not your final design. You're just doing it to explore to see, is this feasible? What problems am I gonna have? So you quickly throw stuff together. You get it like, an, I think this will work, or I see it kind of working. And you go, thank you, prototype, and you shelve it you use that as kind of an experience. You, the problem right now is when you do architecture, you get something kind of working, you show off to somebody, then you answer the worst question you can answer as a programmer. Your boss or a coworker goes, wow, that's really cool. How long does it take to finish that off? And you'll say, oh, in about three weeks or something like that. Well, the problem is what you did is prototype. It's throwaway work, it's horrible, it's hackish. And you never can land the airplane because you weren't designing to land the airplane, you're designing to, to explore. So prototype to learn, never commit. If you can in industry, prototype in a different language. Then there's no option to say, how long can you finish it? Well, it's in a different language. So like math operations, do it in MATLAB, right? You know, do other things in different languages just to show proof of concept and now you know it's doable, then you do it in your final language, in your final environment. Asserts, if something can never happen, throw an assert. Asserts are real-time traps that go away in release. So it costs you zero in release, but it adds that conditional check in uh, debug. So if a square root function can't take, it shouldn't take a negative number, put an assert in there. See, if you know, the variable in there is negative, throw an assert, right? Um, so, you can't, this is a kind of a quick way to add a lot of testing through your code that's runtime there. It's not complete, but it's better than nothing. Um, as you see, a lot of my styles, I put asserts everywhere. Just getting the habit of it is really a nice approach, right? So here's one magnitude squared, right? So we look at this code, right? What can go wrong? No pointer. No pointer, right? So we check the pointer. So you know, square root function, we check that the, uh, you know, the value is greater than or equal to uh, zero, right? So we're just putting these little checks in here very quick to do. Um, you know, I guess you don't even have to do null, you can just do that for a pointer, that's, that's good enough. All right, refactoring. We're gonna constantly refactor our code for a couple different fe features. Technically, refactoring does not mean adding functionality, it just means reconditioning what you have. So you make it faster, more memory or resource um, beneficial, make it more stable, make it more easy to maintain or readable, right? 
the one of the things here is if your coat gets cleaner and, and better, it becomes inherently more readable. And one of the things I always pride myself is that I would write code that's clean enough that an intern can maintain it. I'm not trying to do trickery. You don't need to do tricks. If you can keep your logic cleaner, that's good. So you don't get points for making complicated, ugly code. You get points for making good, solid, stable code, right? Um, the, if you read the Mar Martin Fowler book on refactoring, he has a book where he talks about refactoring smells. And so he has in the back of the book, he has a thousand different smells. And you just, if my code looks bloated, that's a smell. And you flip to that section and you read how to fix that. And, you know, I have duplicated code here. I have too much functionality here. So he goes to everything by smell. And that all comes from his, uh, his, his uh, guidance from his mom. His mom's like, when you're taking care of your baby, you know, if it smells, change it. <laughs> Was it like the, her advice? So follow your nose. Our robust design, these are, um, trying to make something robust is you gotta be able to handle stuff that's unexpected. What's expected? If it compiles, it's expected, right? So um, ha giving a negative number to a square root is an expected data. It's not what you want, but it's expected. <clears throat> what do you do when that state happens, right? So that's robust design is that you catch things. A lot of times what we do in real-time code is we detect a problem and we replace it. So if you have a network feed coming in, you check the data, that's good, let it go. Network feed comes in, it's incorrect, abort it, or place a dummy object in its place and let that dummy object go through the system. The dummy object does nothing, it does no harm. What we want to do is catch it as the time of entry, and then from that point on, we know we have stable data that can work through. Design by contract. This is another pattern that we're going to use a lot. Is if you can, if you give me data in a, with certain preconditions, I guarantee data in certain post conditions, and invariants are still true. So what this means is, if I give you code. It's like sitting like going, fine, I'm gonna give you a lot of points, right, in a bag. I want to find the bounding sphere around all these points for collisions, let's say. So here's here's a lot of points, you know. Dun, 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 dun. And then I'm gonna return the bounding sphere of that, right? So my precondition is I'm gonna give you many points. Post condition is I'm gonna give you a bounding sphere, right? My post condition is that my bounding sphere, center and radius has to contain all of those points. If I don't make it, I don't make my post condition. My precondition is you gave me all the points that are in correct form and I know the total count, right? Now, the invariant is whatever was true before I call that function is still true after the call function. I don't change the memory system. I don't change, um, you know, like the class variables in there that, that aren't associated to this problem. So I don't do some global damage or change the score or something like that while it's happening. So this design my contract. There was a language, this, this technique is very strong for uh, software engineering. Um, there's a language called Eiffel that actually has this codified. Um, so Eiffel as in the Eiffel Tower, right? Interface, um, RTFM, almost nobody reads the manual. Um, so we need to be a little bit smarter with our interfaces. If you have three ints, you can put those in any order and it will compile, right? One might be count, one might be what value you're setting it to, right? One might be color or something like that. If you swap those variables around, it'll still compile and we might give you a surprise. So if you have stuff that's not intuitive, put it into a structure, give the structure reasonable names for each of your arguments and also try to pass things by references, you know, when, when appropriate pointers if you're uh, modifying linkages. Tracer bullets, right? So tracer bullets come from the military concept that if you are um, shooting, you know, one of those big rifle, you know, machine guns, you know, there's a there's sights and you're supposed to slowly exhale and push the button and, and it shoots off the round. But the reality is when you're shooting at, say a Jeep, somebody's shooting at you, right? You're not gonna like, 
breathe in, make sure on an off heartbeat and push the button, right? You're getting shot at, you're crapping your pants, you're freaking out. So what they do is they tell you to shoot at the ground. And you go, doo -doo -doo -doo, and you shoot the ground, and you follow the dirt, and you drive the dirt smoke to the Jeep, and then Jeep goes away. At night, they put phosphor in there. Round. So every you know, seventh or ninth round has a streak of light, green or, or red, and you just drive the lines towards your target and it goes away. So we can do the same thing with coding. It's called transfer bullets for coding. And what we're going to do is if you're going to estimate and try to develop something, you don't, you try to quickly develop the whole thing in one day. And what you do is like, oh man, there's a big math calculation. So it's going to be, you know, it's taking two weeks to figure it out. You say, here's this math function, return five. That's it. And you start doing this stuff. Well, I need this object here. And what you do quickly is you start to prototype boxes. So you have, here's a box. And then this guy talks to this box. And then, you know, this one also talks to here. You know, do I want this talking to this box, right? And you're like, oh shit, I forgot. I need many of these, right? Well, now I need a factory that generates these. Well, by prototyping each of these boxes, you identify things and to identify connections to things. And if you didn't prototype this, maybe that factory takes you three days. You didn't even estimate that. You know, so if you're just like looking at, well, I'm just looking at this connection, not the rest, you, you are missing a lot of things. So we, we do this tracer, we trace through the whole system as quickly as possible, and we put stubs in there. And it's just to identify classes or objects. That's called a tracer uh, bullet system. Really useful. We'll be doing that too. Test driven development. Everybody probably has seen this already. Uh, test driven development is the same technique that we did in Optimize, where I give you unit tests and you code to pass the unit test, right? How test driven works for you, um, if you're writing stuff in the wild, is that you would um, try to do one functionality, one, one, one item with your class, then you write the unit test, it fails. You turn around, write enough of code to get it to work, then you go to the next one. So you're constantly writing the test first, failing, and writing just enough of code to pass that test. And you keep rinsing and repeating and doing this. And what that guarantees is that you don't get lost in the weeds, you don't focus on other problems. If you need to write a test, then it's not a problem. You're not worried about it. You have minimal coverage of your whole code base because you have at least one test per interface on it. Um, it keeps you kind of focused. This technique is fantastic for small libraries, for small classes. This thing falls on its face when you deal with large systems because you can't write the test to cover all the interactions between all the different systems, right? So this is much more micro flavored. If you take this to the extreme, some people think you can do a whole architecture this way. I've seen people have done it. I've actually reviewed code uh, in the industry that did this. It becomes spaghetti code because it's like the unit tests work, but good God, don't look underneath the hood to see how it's wired together because it's just functionally works, right? All right, skills. So here's, here's kind of what I call the three legs to the table, right? And we have language, design, and process. So at first, when you graduate on uh, uh, software engineering, you're like, okay, you're, you're at zero here on everything. And then you go full length here, this is a 10. Full length in architecture, that's a 10, here's a 10. And we connect these points, this becomes the area, right? The larger the area, the more complete you can actually do software development, right? So let me give you some examples here. You come out of school and you you know you know C plus plus well right let's say you're you're at a three remember C plus plus I mean Strasstrup is at a six or a five right and Myers is at a seven right <coughs> so three I'll take a three right and cool I know language but if you don't know your architecture and if your architecture is a one and your process is a, a one or a zero this is your area of your triangle so what does a young engineer do or programmer do? they start reading books. They read more effective C++, all these different books, right? So effective C++, more effective, effective STL, more exceptional STL, you know, all those different things, right? And they start moving it out. I was like, boom, now you're at this, right? Well, now it's just a narrow triangle and you still 
can do stuff. So, so your next thing is, okay, let me improve my architecture, right? So you go after the architecture line and, you know, adding refactoring, you know, design patterns, you know, um, you know, kind of, I'll say just design pattern in UML, you move out to this part right here. So you could have a great project and just having an architecture doesn't get you a lot of area, right? Because it can, you can have great architecture, but if it's not implemented correctly, you, your project still fails. So what you need is a little bit in all three directions at the same time. So process, pragmatic programmer, you know, understanding the different uh, scrum and different agile processes will give you a lot of um, process. And just by doing the first book in each one of these, and this is what we'll go over in class, you're gonna move your, your line out quite a bit. And now your area of your triangle is a lot larger. And you can then kind of skew towards what area interests you more. So just doing the different processes, you know, design my contract, trace your bullets, you know, um, adding assertions, doing different things like this, that technique is going to get more stable code. You can move faster. You can start estimating your stuff better. So your pragmatic side starts moving up. Architecturing right with the right design patterns, real-time stuff will actually make your code design better. Then whatever language you're in, you can master that language to make sure it's there. If you, as you learn these three legs, you can then either do projects completely solely so an architect can do all three of these areas really well, or you can start having teams where you can't code it enough in a day, you're doing the architecture and you have two or three programmers working for you or with you doing the implementation, but you have enough knowledge to oversee them and watch that, <clears throat> right? So these are three really good books to kind of get you on that direction. So Effective C++, Scott Myers with the bad hair, uh, refactoring this book with the smells for architecture and then pragmatic programmer, right? So those are kind of the quick and dirty way to get us um, kind of learning about uh, architecture. So any questions? All right, let's do a break and, uh, and we'll be back at seven. It's right now 7.14 and we'll come back at 7.30. And then we'll go after the, this is uh, our first PA. Cool. All right. Thanks. Hey, you can get Ben, are you coming? Ben. Where's Ben? Huh? No, I'm just kidding. Because we, we usually yeah. go out together. Yeah. Uh, why isn't he here? Oh, okay. he messaged me. Uh, can we together and complete this? Something? Yeah, the same thing. Yeah. 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 It's it's a it's a it's lower it's like it's like right here above your like your waist. It, it, it's where so the nerves come in from each of your legs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And some people who sit, it was like I don't have it, but they say it's like excruciating pain. Yeah. My dad had it, so yeah. Am yeah. I just trying to be kind of close? Yeah. 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 It's the nerve which comes in and that gets pinched when you pinch. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if it's really bad, they, there's a lot of times exercises, if it's starting to, you can kind of get a little separation there yeah. and, and kind of get do space so it can way heal. Way? No, so it can heal. Oh. Um, <clears throat> but if you can't, they have to go in there and fuse. They actually separate the, the bones apart in your spine and then they put a rod between them. Yeah. I was still bringing up. Dude needs help. Or it's just a Ben sitting on a clutch <laughs> <laughs>
I think I've done my promise in my class pretty soft. Magnuk. So it goes. I remember you told me to schedule, but I forgot already. Oh, yeah, yeah. One more thing to ask you. That point that one. I think that one I think. I'm gonna take a nap. Hmm? I'm gonna take a nap. You should. Yeah. This ten minute naps are the most important ones. Yeah. So what do you teach us now? Uh, I teach pre calc. Okay. So you're good at cal calculus? When I try. <laughs> Honors, Excel? Uh, it's mostly, the, kid, the, the kids are mostly honors. I don't teach calculus here, thankfully. Teaching calculus trash. <laughs> <laughs> it is, the kids don't know shit and then you're expected to fix them. Um, Did you? Yeah. Thank you. You have to follow college board's rules and everything. Uh, listen, I have juniors in, in pre-calc who can't add fractions. I got bigger problems. Yeah, no, I'm, <laughs> I don't envy the calc teacher. It's, it's terrible. <laughs> Okay. Luckily, it's spring break next week, so. Yeah. Next week, break? Yeah, for us, it's next week. Okay. Mm hmm. So I'm getting the fuck out of here. Supposed to be in last week? No, for you all, it's, for DePaul, it's last week. For Chicago Public Schools, it's next week. Oh, okay. So. Thanks. So. Yeah, so I'll be out of town next week because I'm actually going to be on vacation. Mm hmm. Claudius, did you get signed up for all of his classes as well? Like, are you in his little dance card from now until the end of time? Probably, yeah. Yeah, same. Is anyone else in here in multi -threaded? Yes. Yeah. All most of you? Most of us, probably. Great. <laughs> We're listening too much of each other. Excellent. <laughs> multi threading is different. Were you in his, were you in his other one? Hmm? Were you in his other multi-threading class, the one in winter? This is, my, this is going to be my first one. Oh, it's fall. You're right. I've lost track of time. Fall. <laughs> that one. Because I know he was in it. That's why I met him. God, I've never felt so dumb in my life. There's only like two master students, or in person at least. It was no. me and Arpit, right? Yeah. Only two? There was only two master students in that class. It was me and Arpit. And Arpit graduated, I think. Yeah. And then there was... um. James Ship and then Cass, not Cass. Kate. Kate. Mm -hmm. Cass was optimized, sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was a small class. Yeah, I'm curious to see how the number of students in class drop off in these courses compared to like optimized or something. Honestly, if you've made it this far, you're probably going to be in until the end. Oh, oh, I think I think a lot of people will not drop the course; they just stop. I mean, that's just costing themselves thousands of dollars. I, I feel, yeah. I feel People just like choose Zoom over and over again once they get deeper into the water, I think. Assuming they even tune in. Yeah. I try to make myself come because if I'm watching at home, I am not paying attention and I know myself. Same. I'm just like, oh, my TV is there. And I could be doing literally anything else. I just end up like washing dishes while I'm listening to him talk, which is like, <laughs> you better be not sleeping. 
I mean, at that point, I just turn off the TV. <laughs> Did you say which direct text we needed? Eleven. Oh, cool. Easy. And uh, DX eleven, what's that? Twenty ten? Yeah, maybe every laptop should have that now. Yeah. Yeah, even because of my C++, because I have the M1 Max, I've just been spending all my time in the labs here. It's oh, so man. much better. Jesus. I'm here for research all the time anyway, so now I'm here for classes and research all the time. Nice. Do you see sunlight or no? Sorry? Do you see sunlight or no? I do. Okay, good. Just because oh, I, I, my bed's right next to a window. That's the only reason. Oh. <laughs> Apart from that, there's no more. Oh, well, that's not fun. Yeah, it's my last quarter, so I'll be done with it then. Yeah, I have to. I have to like stay outside of this building until like class starts because if I come in too early, there's like no windows. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, the lab which I my research lab has windows and everything, and I'm okay. So it's, that's it's, that's it's, perfectly fine. Yeah, it's it's doable. Yeah, but these rooms. I can't. Yeah. Usually, if I'm working on the classes, I'll just go to the 
lab on the ground floor, on the first floor. Yeah, and there's windows there for sure. Yeah, <laughs> a little too many over there, I feel. Because you always just hear people screaming in the yeah. streets. Yeah. I like the light, but not the sound. I have some chips, too. Do you want some chips? Yeah. Man, I would love to do this in Vulcan, but <laughs> metal. Did you say Vulcan? Yeah. Oh, I don't know anything about it. Is that a graphics engineer? Yeah, API, yeah. It's just lower level than yeah, anything ever. Yeah, Takes like 600 lines of code to draw a triangle. Is that? I mean, I'm assuming it does this very quickly. It can. The, the, the analogy is like OpenGL is like just a regular car and uh, Vulcan is like a, a F1 car. Okay. So every little bit counts. But if you do it right, that's right. If, 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 if you do it right, you get yeah. is the biggest proponent of Vulcan. That's easy for me to do. That's good enough. Yeah. Yeah, you're all much more into the details of implementation than I am. I just recently learned that streams came in Java 1.8, and I'm very proud of myself for knowing that off the top of my head. <laughs> <clears throat> What's the minimum version of OpenGL we, we need for it to work? Um, I got C 4.3. 4.3. What do you have? I, 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 no, I looked up M1 Max. Apparently, they can do 4.1. I don't know why the four on Pacquiaza had three three. Only. Yeah, three three. Why? I don't understand. Yeah, but it's four. It's, Apparently, it's four one. Is so, it but, four one through parallel? I, it, yeah, emulation. Well, it, here's here's the because when I looked up that it said three three even online on the parallel website. Yeah. And I have an M one Mac, and mine also said three three. I don't know. I, I read I read forums say four one. Yeah. So. This is a sore part. This frustrates me so yeah. much, but I just think it's better. You, you guys aren't going to notice anything. I'm just going to have to be in another shit storm for the next <laughs> five weeks redoing everything. But uh, Trek X is probably the better way to go because you're getting what, 11? 11. 11, 11 in, with, with, yeah. With, uh, right. Parallels, right? Because if, if, you're, if you're 11 on, we're fine. Yeah, it is 11.4. Yeah, yeah, you're fine. Yeah. Um, yeah I so. so I don't know. I think that makes more sense. I wasn't expecting that, but that's how it works. All right. Um, and you uh, came to know what, about this this morning? Yeah. That was in the graphics piazza, right? Yeah. The, the other one? Yeah, so, uh, somebody did the. Was it in this class or the other one? Wasn't it this one? It might have been. Um, I don't know. They, the, they're all I mean, merging right the now. Other one could not no, not no. So then it must have been that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Either it's no problem. All right. So let's talk about the uh, the first assignment. We're we doing an object system. Yeah. Hey, professor. Yes. Hello. Hi. This is Krishna. Uh, so I was just wondering whether the lecture slides it's available uh, in detail or anything. Everything will be available on Perforce uh, later today. Oh. Okay, uh, so can we have access to the slides in advance uh, to the class? Because it's easy for me to write the notes in the lecture slides rather than writing it anywhere else so that I can relate with the class more. Yeah, um, I will try to give it. I, you know, no guarantees, but I should be able to push it up there right before. Um, thank thank you. A lot of marker board, you'll see in a second. Uh, so okay. the marker board will not be there. Um, these are just can slides they're pretty easy ones but yes i'll do that yeah okay. All right. thank you professor um, the neighboring classes in theory you know i didn't want to hear all right um all right so what we want to do is make a way to search and control objects, right? So um, what is an object? It's just really, if you really think about it, all an object is, and I got in long discussions about this with, with my uh, fellow colleagues here, and um, what, is, what is computer science? What is uh, 
computer science in a nutshell, if you want to describe it all the way down to the bare bones, it's data structures, conditioning, moving, associating data structures. That's it. All computer science is somehow associated to conditioning and moving data. That's it. Sorting data, changing data, converting data, finding data. So it's really this data structure with methods, right? And that's what a container is, right? An object. Object just holds the data when we have associated uh, methods that we can work on it. So back before C++ kind of came around, we were doing objects and classes kind of the poor man's way by just doing structures and associated methods with those structures. We kind of get this whole, whole thing. And so one of the things we want to do is how do we connect those things together? So on objects, we want to be able to easily add stuff to a, a container or a list of this stuff. We want to remove it. We want to search for it, retrieve it. We want to try to iterate through all this material as quickly as possible. Then we also have to somehow pass back and forth between things. We can deal with things in a polymorphic way. So like with um, base classes, and we walk and talk a lot through base classes. That's what most of the patterns, um, the design patterns have a lot of that kind of concept. A lot of times we'll have to cast on there. Casting up is very free. You can always cast up, but casting down, we can't cast down without hints or information of what it is or knowing that it's always of the same type. So when we're dealing with memory systems or my memory system, um, object pooling systems, if we have uniform types of objects, we can always cast up and down because we know it's always uniform, same type of object. But once we deal with heterogeneous types, we can't, right? So one of the things here is to think about this is when you have two objects con connected, right, A and B, who owns the other one? Who's in control of that? We have to understand ownership at all times. And this is, this is a key concept for, for architecture is that every object has one owner. So there's one owner that's responsible for the creation or no, not creation, for the deletion and control of it. You can have somebody else own it and then distribute the ownership to another person, but we have to control the deletion. So in this case here, who's walking the, uh, the dog? Is the dog walking the person or the person walking the dog? They're both connected with that leash, that connection between A and B is connected to there. But who's really controlling whom, right? You know, you would think from a hierarchy standpoint, a person's walking their dog. We can see this photograph, the dog is dragging the woman, right? And um, it's more like my dog. And, you know, we have to understand that control and that ownership. So just not the linkage, links are going to tell you that, but also the concept we're going to add on top of this. So when we're dealing with reusing objects, right? So we have some manager, we have literally lots of objects and we, we pluck one off and we use it. And then when we're done, we turn around and we put it back onto the list and pluck it off again. That object from a pointer standpoint has the same address. <clears throat> but 10 minutes ago, it was a car. Now it's an airplane. But the pointer is the same pointer, right? So we need a way to uniquely identify this. And this becomes a kind of interesting problem is what is our unique identifiers? How do we keep our data separate? Because spatially, it's the same bytes, right? The pointers are the same where we use it, the same, but we have to have identifiers. So there we have to think about, okay, how do we have a unique name? Strings are nice. You know, it gives you some ability to do this stuff, but it's, strings are horrible from a standpoint of uh, performance, right? Also, you know, they did some stats. It turns out 70% of all bugs are somehow near strings, which kind of makes sense as well. Um, so, you know, some, some ideas there. It's like strings are really only there for debugging purposes. Really rarely use the string. Um, maybe you take the strings, make them unique names, and then you hash it into a a 32-bit number or 64-bit number, and you can use those as comparisons. And that becomes a lot faster. And then when you're debugging, you then look at the, the print statement and, and kind of give out the number. But we have to consider that when we reuse objects, we have to have uniqueness. 
every byte in your object in your uh, library has to be accounted for. This is what makes this a real-time system. At any time, I should be able to hit stop, and every single structure, everywhere in the whole class, everywhere in the whole application, we should know who owns it, who's responsible for cleaning it up. When this system shuts down, make sure that all of its resources are released. Right. Um, so we have to kind of keep track of that. So there's a lot of different ways to keep track of that, but we need a, a systematic way to deal with this. Right. So first of all, just a side note. Does anybody know who this guy is? Is that Feynman? Yes, thank you. That's always, I'm happy in my heart that somebody knows who the heck it is. All right, so it's Feynman. Um, and this is Apple photograph. You see there, it says think different, it's Feynman. Feynman uh, is Nobel laureate, nuclear physics, worked on an atomic bomb, but he taught himself his own differential equations and calculus when he was in uh, sophomore year in high school. He did it with diagrams, so he created his own math just because he's like, this stuff's going too slow, I just do it my way. And it happens to be right. So there's a thing called Feynman diagrams. Anyway, really smart guy. All right, um, so there's this whole idea that memory management can be done by automated systems. So in Java, you have garbage collection, right? And reference counting. In C++, we have the three-headed hydra of smart pointers, unique, shared, and weak that could be used for that. The question there is, do memory managed languages ever leak memory? So Java, does it leak memory? Absolutely. C Sharp does leak memory? Absolutely. Python leak memory? Yes. The catch is, how do you have managed languages that leak memory? It seems kind of like against their cell sheet, like the car is fast and it, and it can do the zero to 60 in miles an hour and it says, it doesn't leak memory. And also it's like, it leaks memory. And when you're trying to find those bugs, finding memory leaks inside a memory managed system is horrible. How we had to do it in industry is we had to actually shadow the memory system. Every time you allocate something, we had to actually reflect it in our own tables to track when it was leaking. And it was um, generally leaking because of interesting casting, interesting promotions and coercions between things and just literally confused the whole system. Um, once you start adding multiple threads, the, the thing falls apart even faster. So the catch here is, it's kind of like this. I was in a cigar shop smoking cigars. My wife doesn't like me doing that. And this one guy comes there and goes, warning, cigars are dangerous to your health for smokers and non-smokers. He goes, well, if it's dangerous both ways, what the heck? I might as well smoke cigars, right? <laughs> If memory systems, managed languages, are going to leak memory, then why don't we just do it ourselves? Then now we can't blame Java. We can't blame C Sharp. We can only blame ourselves. We're in control of it. And that weird concept of taking 100% control actually makes it more stable. Right? So what we want to do is try to track all of our allocations and control this stuff. Right? So FedEx is really an interesting animal. It's a great um, study piece. Let's say you want to ship a package from Oakland, California to San Francisco, and it's 12 miles apart. I looked it up. Um, the box will go across the bridge, hop in an airplane, fly all the way to Memphis, get a different sticker, turn around, fly all the way back, go back across the bridge, and go to the new location. Right. Um, so the pros said every single package goes to Memphis, right? There's one location, everything's in there. They track everything. You know, they put all the complexity in this one honking location. And it's Memphis because it's subsidized, right? It's like this huge, like come here, build factories, right? So that's why it's in Memphis. Um, but the cons are like, are you kidding me? We sent this package. 2,000 miles to the center of the country to turn around and come back just to go 12 miles, right? It seems a little bit ridiculous, right? So it's not doing this distribution. Is this a good pattern? Not for that package. Not for that package. But when we look at the collection for everything, the, the, the loss rate is very low. They almost never lose things. It's reliable, surprisingly, right? 
So I'm giving an example of a distributed system. Denver Airport actually got called in to do consulting on this. Um, they built this beautiful new airport. And I'm not kidding you, it's a mile and a half long from Terminal 1 to Terminal 123, I think. It's a mile and a half long straight. It's a straight line. Right? Mark, right? And there's literally terminals that's going the whole thing, right? And they're like, well, we're not going to set our packages, our bags. Because normally on airports, all the bags go to one location. Then they turn on, hop on a different conveyor belt and go to another, right? We want to have smart computers along the way. So we have all these conveyor belts. So we have computers stand there and like, it will read this tag and kick the bag to conveyor belt A or conveyor belt B, right? And they did this and they had literally 25 independent decision nodes going through there. It was all automated. <clears throat> and they spent the zillion dollars on this stuff. And uh, at the end, they tore it all out and made it centralized, right? This is like 1995 to 2000 that they tore this all off and redid it again. Um, because it was distributed, they couldn't keep this track. And this is just baggage systems at one airport, <laughs> right? So my suggestion is we deal with central warehousing. Everything comes to our central location. We're the architects. We'll make a system very smart. We'll put all the complexity in our box. And then every user of our system uses it very nice. Like, give me this. Okay, here it is. Give me it back. All right, I reuse it and do stuff. So we are the central location and all of our customers are just users of it. So it's kind of like this. We don't sit there and have people build books on demand, ship it to you, then you're supposed to dispose it, or you're supposed to ship it to another person. We're gonna sit there and say, you know what? You, the library buys all the books, puts all the stamps in the books, hands you the book, you use it, when you're done, you give it back to the library. We clean it up and we put different print on it and we give it to somebody else. Everything goes back to the library. And once we have everything in a central location, we can control how many objects are open. We know who has every object. We can also recycle every object. So we go with the concept that nobody owns it, except, the, except the system or the library owns it. And in that way, we're mimicking more FedEx, right, with that central location, right? So we need a, an object system that has a centralized manager. We want to group our objects by type or functionality. We want to have resource pooling so we can recycle these objects. Just like before, we all know that news and deletes cost cycles. Well, if you create a thousand particles and you're only using 10 particles at a time, you can recycle those and keep reusing those and maybe you only need 10 total. It gives an illusion of a thousand. Right? How do we relate objects together? We have the standard approaches, linked list, arrays, we can do hierarchy. We can kind of do any kind of associations between things. And there's also newer techniques, um, entity component modeling, where we actually dis decouple objects versus behaviors. We'll talk about that as well. And these things we have to keep in mind and how to deal with this, right? <clears throat> well, then we have the next problem. So great, we got objects, but what if we want to transfer it on the network? We want to store it on a hard drive, but we want to pass it around. We have to serialize our data that's expanded from many objects into a, a data blob and we can move that data blob around. So we need to serialize and deserialize the data as well. Right? Then we also need the ability to clone things. Right? We need the ability <laughs> to um, <clears throat> duplicate things. So let's say we had a car uh, uh, in a video game but we want five of these cars. Do we need to have five full models? We just need to cut and paste those things five times. So we can have one high res model and draw it five times, right? But then what if we want to change the color? Well, we're just changing the color of each car, but there's still one car replicated five times with five different colors. Well, then each of those cars could be on different locations. So now we have this whole idea of replication, scaling, and cloning. Is it a full copy, deep copy? Is it a shallow copy, reference copy? So we need to kind of keep control of all that. And so you're starting to see we need a larger, larger, complex system. Anything can be thrown at our, our real-time system, right? And um, 
we need a way to also compartmentalize things into hierarchies, right? So here's kind of where we're going after is we need, you know, to solve all these problems at once, which is quite a lot. And we need the ability to, in our system, to have a very small footprint. So our cost to manage this stuff can't be a lot. You know, if we're managing, you know, say four floats or three floats, we don't want to spend, you know, 20 integers worth of, or pointers worth of data to manage three. That's a bad ratio. We want our, our ratio to be small and we're managing larger things, right? We want it easy to add and remove, right? So some of the API considerations we need to be able to create and remove, we need a will ability to debug this. And we need a way to add um, associations without changing the data. So the idea like this, let's say you have a block of data, right? So here's your data. And now you want this in a linked list, you just associate it to a linked list. Right, you link. You want it onto a hash map. You just put it to a hash map node, so forth. And because you're doing inheritance, everything below is still the same. Your connections are, are above there, are just being linked. So it's some kind of mixing scenario, right? So let's talk about the problem, right? All right. So what we want is the ability, the first kind of um, library or, or thing we want, I call it an object system. And what we want to do is really just allow us to have arbitrary hierarchy. Because if we can do this, <clears throat> we can make this tree, we can almost make anything, right? So we need a way to make this very quickly, very efficiently, right? To give people some reference here in um, SC456, we did, we did a shield that was, had a group of the whole shield and then we had individual columns and individual bricks. And this is show you, you know, like, you know, this is kind of remind us here, you know, so here's a shield and then each of these bricks are different items on that tree, right? And so we can kind of group and deal with the, 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 the shield in, in different ways. So in that case here, we kind of had this pattern. We kind of had one and we had different columns. Then each column had multiple bricks. I drew them too close together, clearly. Right, and so that would be that battery for the, the shield, right? So what we want is ability to have hierarchy. We don't know any rule to this. You might have three children, you might have one children, you might have, you know, five children. Um, we can turn around this add one there, we might sit there and take this tree here. And then turn around and add it underneath that one. So we want the ability to do this very dynamically with low overhead, right? So that's our problem. So now we start playing market board game, what if, right? So what are some ideas of how to deal with this? Composite. Composite, right? And so. So you, know, you go to your toolbox and go composite, which is, 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 is probably the first step to go in here. So here's a composite um, pattern, right? And the composite pattern is basically a component with a leaf and a composite. So component, everybody is a component. If you have a node here that has no child, no children, it's a leaf. And a composite has multiple children, those children are also components, right? So here. And the idea of this is that you can represent part of the hierarchy or the whole hierarchy. And we can, everybody is a <coughs> component, right? So it's uniform, everybody's a component, right? 
So you can basically create trees this way. And how you would do this is you would create a tree and then you would attach it to the next one. And then this one gets graded and then it gets attached to that. So you kind of attach from the bottom up in clusters, right? Um, so this, this, this is the composite pattern. And this is kind of the first item to there. Turns out this becomes a little muddier, this, this diagram right here, because we're gonna have multiple components, right? Multiple components are owned by the composite, right? And so um, let's, let me finish this and I'll go to more diagrams on this. So we can, what's nice about a composite pattern, it has hierarchy. We can actually structurally set up relationships, like here's the parent, this parent is, holds this data, or this is the, whatever we do, the parent reflects down to the child, right? So let's, let's give an example. Let's say we have a boat, right? Aircraft carrier, and now I put an airplane on there. Right, so here's an airplane, really bad airplane, right? So we have an aircraft carrier, we put an airplane on top of it. Now, if I rotate the boat, I also rotate the okay. airplane because it's attached to it, right? So we have uh, aircraft carrier, right? And we have plane. So if anything I do to the aircraft carrier, this thing propagates and also affects the plane, right? But then I can remove the plane and move it around on the deck of this or even fly it off. And now I can disconnect this and now the plane is its own object, yeah. right? So we can, this hierarchy model gives us a lot of flexibility and things we can't even consider yet. And we can also imply rules on this, which is really cool, right? And one of the nice things is we have it all as a tree. We can look at it as from this point down, or we can look at it as individual items, but everybody is a component. And so it's uniform, right? Um, so let's talk about the reality on this. Here's where comp uh, composites patterns fall apart. So we have here a component, right? And then off of this is a leaf and a composite, right? But the composite owns multiple components, right? So this is what, what type of diamond is this? No, uh, still, no. right. So this is composition here and it can own many of these, right? So we now have inheritance and we have that stupid composite that gives us so much trouble, but it <coughs> owns multiple components. But how do they, you do a composite? Well, traditionally what people do is they make this a dynamic array. So inside the composite, they say, I have a dynamic array, array list, STL vector, right? It grows, oh my God, holy cow. When I already see the terms automatic container, screen, that means slow, that's not real time. Because what happens is, the containers are like, good job, CS person, it works. Bad job, real time people, because it sucks. <laughs> and it's conservative, and it's grossly there. And when you allocate things, it sometimes adds more space. And then when it fills it up, it fills up. When you're not using it, sometimes it doesn't give the space back, right? And this is a, a linchpin of slowness, right? Well, yes, but I know how to use STL. I know how to use containers correctly. Well, guess what? You could, but sometimes you can also use it incorrectly. And the best defense is just don't use it, right? So in SC456, we went with this model, which is a little bit better. Right? But then what we're going to have hanging off of this is we have a D-link manager, and this holds the, the head. Sit down, my right is worth standing. Um, 
and it's bad to start. All right. Um, PO head. Right. And this manages dealings. Dealings is this next and previous. Right. And what we can do on this. Um, we can have this derive from component. Right. So essentially, this is this. Now, this is actually the same pattern as this right here without um, STL. STL, right, or containers, right? And what we did here is we just basically took this section here and made a simple linked list manager. It could be a single linked list, double linked list, doesn't matter what it is, but it's a manager there. And so we, oh, we need three components. We add three, we remove one, remove one. So it's it's minimal and there's no speculation where it grabs 30 of these. So it's, it's not doing the STL damage, um, but it's still kind of problematic, right? So this is where we're at. Composite, look at us there, but can we do better, right? Can we do better? So. Here's my, um, let me do it this way. Here's my uh, pattern, right? A, B, C, D, E. How would I connect these nodes together? Don't worry about the data, because remember, what we're really looking for is we have some base class here. Right, and if we um, glue it on top of data, right? So here's our data. This base class here, whatever we do with this base class, that's our connection. This will be our tree in this case here, or it will be our linked list or our, you know, um, hash map or whatever. This is our connection, that base. So. We are not really worried about the data, we're worried about that connection. So these arrows here or these connections here are the base, right? So how would we do this from a data standpoint? Yeah. I mean, maybe this is a silly thing to say. It seems like there's two there's two ways to do it. There's the way we did it in four, five, six, which is each parent has a link list of its children. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, each child points up to its parent. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know of a third way. Those seem like the two ways to do it. So this one here's each 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 one has a link list. Yeah. Right. And then what's the other one? Each child points up to its parent. Each child points up to parent. So each child has a P parent pointer. All right. So we're trying to draw this picture right here, right? So let's let's talk about this. Um, all right. So here's A. What's in what's in structure A's data set? Two nodes, I think. One is parent and uh, another one is the Child or something like that. Okay, so here's the child and here's the parent, right? Right? Yeah. All right, so let's do, let's do that. Also, so so let's and go, then, <coughs> you know, parent and child, right? Can we draw this picture here? So here's A, right? And who does he point to? That point up is nothing, right? No pointer. No. Who does he go to? No pointer, I'm just agreeing with you. Yeah. Who? who uh, B. Okay. Okay, B. B. And who does B point to? <clears throat> B points back up to A, right? Right. Points down to null. And this points to null, right? Cool. Okay. Sorry, C, D, and E, you lose. No, but I'm, that's why I said A points to a linked list of its children. So A points a linked list of children, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so here's A. Like a D link manager or something. Well, yeah, this. Kind a, you will ne also need a pointer to sibling for doing the D link sort of test or something. I mean, or I guess if a D link handles that, never mind. Yeah, I think uh, that's implicitly handled by the D link. We can have like a uh, left child and right child. Or Assuming there's only two. Left, right, or something mm -hmm. like that. Or we have three childs. Yes, we just asked, is this going to be a binary tree or is it going to have like. 
flexible. It's, it's going to be anything, right? Okay. Just, then yeah, we can't just do left white. Inheritance. Can we use basic inheritance? Yes, we're going to use inheritance. Yes. Yeah. Then um, um, we always have the reference to the parent class, right? It, it, just give me give me the instruction and we can play with it. So let's let's go let's stay with this before we go more complicated, right? Let's do the, let's just do the D link because I think we've all some of us have seen it. A has a parent pointer. Or I guess all nodes have a parent pointer, and then they all have a pointer to the linked list that will be children. Like that? Yeah. And then the linked list will contain the children, the head, the children, that and each child will be a, a, a descendant of A, I suppose. So, so let's let's go back for a second. Let's look at this. What I don't like about this, the for, right? The, no, 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 what the I, I don't like about this, the one to many problem. There's three different classes. So I do different things depending on which class I'm in. So that's why I said they're all the same type of node. Right, but right here, right here, you have you have a link list manager and a and a node. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you not want a link list? We can get rid of the link list and make the nodes be the link list. Well, what I'm getting at is, it, wouldn't it be nice if it's always uniform? I deal with whatever it is. Because yeah, uh, otherwise, it's just okay. Fine. Okay. A has a parent pointer, and A also has a first child pointer, and all and A also has a next sibling pointer. Like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That way you can always go up, down, or I guess okay, so let's, let's, within let's, the layer. Let's, let's, let's stay with this. So we'll call this the Alex approach, right? All right, so here we would have, um, let me change the color. So we'll do it here in orange. We have A, its first child would be B. It goes to C. C's first child goes to D, goes to E, right? This points back, this points back, this points back, this points back, this goes to null, this goes to null, this goes to zero, right? And these goes go to, to zero, and these go to zero. This goes to zero, and he goes to null. So right. E next to. I just I drew all the picture. Oh, this one. Yeah, e, yep. e next is null. Yeah. So that works, right? And what's nice about this, it's one node, right? So no matter where we are, got one node, right? So, you know, um, so I call it parent, child, sibling, right? <laughs> That's what the, the homework assignment is called, parent, child, sibling. So this is next sibling, right? Because it's at the same level, right? But there's, there's, there's a small nuance here, right? We have to be able to add and remove, yep. right? So now I'm going to give you a degenerate one, A, um, E, C, D, E, F, G, H, right? So now let's draw in our, our new pattern. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Is the, is the sibling thing a singly linked list or a doubly linked list? Well, that's what I was getting at. It's, it's right now a single linked list. Right. Right. And then I've I'll, made a single linked list because I don't you because if it's not ordered, it's not much value in being able to go backwards. Well, uh, I'm going to poke a hole in that one. All right. Yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. ready? Delete H. Now you have to loop through the G. Okay. You go, yeah. okay, wait a minute. You go, I have to find G. You have to go up to the parent, go down to the eldest, go no, 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 no. Found it, it was this one, now fix G. <clears throat> and as this becomes 1 million, mm -hmm. you're gonna wish the hell you had a back pointer, mm -hmm. right? So, so a twist is 
then it would make sense to do this. Parent, child, next, next. sibling, and then previous sibling. Right now, you have in this case here when you get rid of this, you can oops, when you get rid of this, you can then go back to G and fix it. If you're in the middle here, you can go back to D and you kind of fix the double link there. Right <clears throat> now, if you kill G, a B, you go to the next guy, go back up, and then change his pointer back down. Right? So this combination, next previous um, parent-child, will give you all the permutations. So our new problem now is, you know, just coming up with, um, you know, did we code this up correctly for all the different edge conditions that can happen? So is, so is the expected, like if I kill... Hold on a second, let me give some names yeah, here. some names here before we start talking nonsense. And they all have their parent pointer, so... You know. So like, let's say C has some children hanging out. Linked list design so what, well, where are we staying? Let's say oh, sorry. some children hanging off of it, right? It's got some stuff. And I, the call comes in, I need you to delete C. Do we kill the children? Right, so that becomes an architecture issue, right? Yeah, I'm just wondering what the expected behavior is. Well, that becomes an architecture decision, mm. right? Yeah, because like technically- I guess we traverse it. down to the uh, leaf node and then and delete uh, them till top. There's no leaf node, they're all the same node. I mean, I'm more than likely just go until it's null. So which one? Yeah, behavior has not been defined yet. You have to define it. You're an architect. So every decision you make has consequences, right? Mm -hmm. so, so, but you have to make a decision, right? I personally think that you should always delete the ch children up. So, you know, no, I won't use that analogy. That would get me in trouble. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Trim the whole branch. There's a better analogy. Yeah. So what you want to do is you want to do, I, I caught myself that time. All right. So um, to me, I think a good architectural issue is that I can delete any node as long as it doesn't have children. But if it right. doesn't have children, it should go, nope, stop. Debug, right. Sir. You know, or, you know, then you can sit there and say, hey, do I have children? Then right through you it. just give the, kick the problem back to the user saying, hey, I want you to delete, uh, you know, this like here, let's imagine you had a, uh, a car, um, a transport semi truck that had three cars on it. And you say, delete the semi. Like, wait a minute, there's three cars on this, right? I'm not gonna delete the semi, there's three cars on it. So they're like, going, oh, there's three cars. You just say, no, I can't, three cars. Or no, I can't, I have children. So to do like- And they, they'll, they'll yeah. let the person- uh, so they, like, you know, well, no, you know, I just wouldn't allow that to happen. You would crash. Uh, no, I would give it back, right? Um, but the, the catch here is you control the front door. Remember, this is the lowest level. You can put a wrapper above that saying, oh, delete this node. And you can sit there and say, and children or not children. And then you can iterate through and kill all the children. Or you can sit there and say, only, you know, don't do the children. Maybe you just want to kill, maybe you just want to kill C and move everybody up. You know what I mean? Yeah. That might be a, a, a functionality. <laughs> so this is where you're the architect. You get to decide. I have a philosophical question, I guess. <coughs> Who owns C? Because A does not point directly to C, B points directly to C. And so like, is the rationale like- A owns it. A owns it. Because it's the root, because it's the root of the tree? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's how I would look at it. Even if it's no matter how nested it is. No, I just, ownership isn't arrows. Ownership is concepts, mm. right? A, I would say here, in this case here, we have A and then we have B, C, D, E, and then underneath is F and G, right? <clears throat> um, I would say A owns everything. Okay. Right? And then, oh, C owns F and G, right? 
so to me, ownership is, is children, right? Now, children in this case here, A's children, if I could have had four child pointers, I would have had four child pointers. Mm -hmm. But I don't because I want to be efficient with my, my pointer linkages, right? So we made this, this double link list by siblings and double link list vertically. And if you think about it, all we did was we just said, hey, here's a box we need to go up and down it. And here's a box we need to go right and left of it. It's just two dimensionals, right? But this one little widget here gives us really a flexibility to do anything. So if we wanted to, we can sit there and say, everything is flat off of the, you know, I would always kind of go with this. You always have a null um, root, right? And then you can sit there and say, I have tons of children, right? I just have a bazillion children, right? Well, in this case here, what do you really have? You have a double link list, right? I have my root and then I have all my children going vertically. Well, I really just have a double link list vertically, right? So from this standpoint here, really all you have is a double link list. But we can then start doing this as a hierarchy and kind of creating all kinds of combinations, adding to the tree, removing from the tree. And then later we can add iterators. So we iterate top down, bottom up on the tree. Because remember, whatever weird scheme we come up with, we can always add an iterator to it, right? And the iterator is what we'll use in our application Complexity, we do whatever magic it is to make the iterator once and we're done with it. We never look at it again, right? So now, if you were going to search for an object, right? Right, and, and it's, it was a little bit more of a balance, let's say this, like more like a balance tree, right? What do we have here? We have layers, right? We have three different levels that it has to go through, right? And we can look at the number of levels, the height, and the number of elements, we can kind of get its shape, right? And we can say, okay, if we have to search this thing here, maybe we can search in more of a binary fashion, right? We can start off with going to this node, let me give it a different color. I got it, yeah, I have to play around with these colors because it's too light. Um, go in here, like, is it right or left? It's left, is it right or left? It's left, it's right or left, it's, it's right. You know, and we can kind of go through this and find this thing with a, a quick binary kind of walking. But if our, if our data is, you know, much more vertically oriented, right? Now, we're gonna be doing more compares to get to that node worst scenario, just because it's not square. Right? So a useful thing is to know how many levels and what's our total count. Just to give us a, a feel like, on, geez, this thing's going to be like hard to search or it's going to be easy to search, right? If this thing has searchable attributes, right? Um, but maybe it's added into the tree in an unsorted way, so it doesn't matter. But it's nice to kind of give yourself heuristics to say, I know how many levels there is and how many there isn't. So let's look at the, the homework. So, um, so here's the PA. In a, oops, no. And we can see, here's our data. Parent, child, next sibling, previous sibling. Right? And just by having this node is exactly what we kind of organically came up with. We can drive, put this as a base class and drive our data underneath it. For debugging purposes, we might want to give that, that node a name, you know, just so we can print it out and see what the name is. But, you know, that could be optional in the future, but just for right now, we can see the name, right? And so what are some of the things we can do with this? <clears throat> We have obviously the, the big four operators, the destructor, the assignment operator, the copy constructor, and the default. We can have a specialized that names everybody, right? 
Um, we can set our individual ones. We can get our individual ones. Um, set and get the names, right, and print. On the tree, what does the tree hold? It just holds the first node. It just holds the root. So now we're looking at this. Right? Here's our tree. Tree. It just points to the first root. That's all. And then maybe I'll have some info here. Right? Just to get on some stats. And now our info can be number of current nodes. What was the maximum? That's useful because if we hit a certain peak number, we know we can reserve that a number up front. Because these nodes can be now pooled and reused and recycled, right? So it's like going like, hmm, I'm playing this application and all of a sudden I know that my peak number hit uh, 2000. Yeah, what are you right now? I'm at 25. But at one point in this application, I hit 2000. What I could do at the beginning of the application is to say, reserve 2000. Now there's no dynamic news for this. And I can just take them off there. And when I'm done, I give it back to FedEx or get back to the library and say, here library, take it back, right? So that's why we're in this maximum levels. How deep are we? How many levels down and how many up there is what are occurring? This is not that useful. It's more for us to kind of, we're dealing with data. We want to kind of know the shape of it. We tried printing this out. You're just gonna get, prints, right? But you would have to print out in a hierarchy tree to see where it is. This gives us kind of like poor man's idea of levels, right? So this is for debug, you know? And then what do we do with the tree? We have the big four, right? And now you notice right here, I put these as delete. And the reason why I have these as delete is that <clears throat> I'm just saying for, for our library, our first pass of the library, we're not going to copy the full tree over or assign the full tree over. There's one tree, that's it, right? And these trees are becoming the manager holder, the way the, the, the things actually manage, right? <laughs> so get the root, insert. Now, insert and remove, right? You want to remove a node, remove a node. <laughs> I put no protection on there, but this is one of those things where architecturally, this is the PCS tree. We can make a manager saying, hey, here's all of our sounds, audio sounds. And we sit, sit there and say the, uh, the tree is over that. So we use this as a Lego, as a building block, right? We can sit there and say, you know what? We have this thing called a, um, an audio manager, right? And it has some data. And what does it point to? It points to a tree, and that tree now has the first node, and it has the node, however it was attached, <clears throat> right? And then this is where, this is the front door. So we can sit there and say, you can't delete something that has children, or you can. Oh, if we do this, maybe we'll, inside that function, iterate through and delete all the children first before we delete its node. Or we simply say, remove node, move everybody up. We can make those executive decisions in the screen box. And all of this stays the same. So that's why I'm not doing that big decision. You know, um, we're not putting complication. We're just building a Lego brick. Later, we'll use the brick uh, many other places. Right? Um, but for right now, I, I said, let's not do uh, full copies, just because I didn't want to write the unit test for it. Really, the real reason. <laughs> Trust me, you'll see why. All right. Uh, so this is it. We're adding or removing, right? Here's the unit test. <clears throat> right. Um, <laughs> oh my god. All right. So now. When do we have to solve this? <laughs> next week. No oh guy. <laughs> All right, it's, it's, don't, don't get uh, there. So it's not as bad as it looks. It's really not, not that bad. It's, yeah, it's in it, I think. So right here, let me show you. I came up with this. 
this tree right here, you know, here's the tree. You know, here's this pattern, right? And then all I did is I took this pattern and said, okay, how would you draw it in our new form? Here's how it would look like. Right. So it's, you know, its child is D, which is its eldest. Think about, just think about, mimic kind of the, 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 the nuclear family kind of thing. The parent has their eldest kid. Then the, you know, you talk to the oldest kid and say, okay, Jill, where, where's, where's your brother? Oh, there he is. And where's, where's, hey, where's, where's your sister? Everybody's responsible for the kid younger, right? You know, think about it like large families. Um, so this all works, you know, so this pattern follows really nicely, right? But what I found was this pattern here has every edge condition. <laughs> so if you delete every single node, add every node, you have covered every edge condition, right? So where did this come from? I made this up. This is, you know, this is, you know, of course, I mean, this how, this how most stories start. Um, but but what, what this was for was at Midway Games, I was doing a memory system with a heap. And the heap has inside of it another heap. And then we subdivide that heap and that heap and that heap. So imagine root being all the memory on the PlayStation 2. Then A would be a subsection of that, B would be a subsection of that, C would be a subsection, and then we subdivide each of those boxes and each of those boxes, each of those boxes. So everything is in one super box root, but then everybody's in these sub boxes. So that's how this kind of came about. And um, and I'm like, when I need a really quick way to do a tree that's uniform because I don't want to like deal with special conditions, conditions, right? So so here's this. So all you do now with this guy is um, everything's there, compile it. <laughs> right, and so you see out of 80 tests, one passed. Right. Hey, congrats, you got one. <laughs> and then, no, it's, it's version number. <laughs> so and then that still this, counts for something that still counts you're one 80th done i gave you a freebie <laughs> um and then if you just double click it tells you what line failed right just double click the same as all my tests right um so you can you know obviously don't go through all these up front you would turn on test and slowly increment it right so now here's sketch um that's debug here's release Right. Same thing. No, 64. What do you want? No, no, we're not doing 64-bit. I, I, I said, I don't think there was a good return in 64 academically. I will talk about it if you want, but it's really not. You guys don't need more distraction. You got 80 tests, that's not enough, right? All right, so, all right, so there it is, right? So both fail, right? So now let's look at the um, solution. Now, I never give you something that I don't do. That's my promise. Um, so, here it is working. I wonder if Teddy can fail the version check. <laughs> no, it will work. It's too hard. He can save that. No points at. Then you get to. All right, so 80 pass. Well, what I did here is 8,300 individual checks. Yeah. Right? So that means I hand wrote 8,000 different steps to check yep. so now you can see why i'm like going i'm not doing deep copies so here it is boom boom oh god do you actually sleep, sleep? no <laughs> that's why i get grumpy um sleep is for uh, the people who don't do software engineering exactly um so anyway there it is all right now how this works is kind of interesting. Um, so there it is working in debug and then also works in release. Um, I believe you. I believe me? All right. Yeah. Couple things to add here. It does work. Oh, there goes my spring yeah. break. Seven days? One week. Oh, yep. Yeah, so see, it all works. All right. Um, 
so the insert, right? Let me, yeah, move this one. All right, so this insert, how this works is this picture right here is me creating. <clears throat> And then and then and then and then and then that picture. <laughs> All right, so this picture right here, I start off with a root, right? And I sit there and say, okay, attach this root. So I attach this root node. Then I go, attach C, then attach uh, B, then attach A. So what can you deduce there? I'm always, I want to insert this to the tree quickly. The quickest way to add something to the tree is at the front, at the front, the front. Yeah. right? So this goes in the backwards <laughs> ordering of adding, right? So when you do this, when you say, you know, you have a node here, A, right? And you go insert, right? B comma A, A is the root, is the parent, right? And also this becomes B, right? Then you just go, Insert C comma A, right? It's going to go here to C, yeah, right? And then if you do D, and what I'm doing is I'm just pushing in front of the list because mm -hmm. well, inserting in front is order one. You can do, 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 do. Oh, I add it in there, right? Um, if I'm evil, I can make this by did this. I can make the circular link, and then you can add to front or back. But I don't think that was needed. I, I actually like, I like terminating when your iterators are nulls. It just seems cleaner. It has less problems. And um, but this is kind of the rules of the game. Right? So then, by this I logic, the child of A would be D, right? Yeah. So so this right here now looks like this, A. D. D. C, boom, on right. right, and then obviously, you know, everybody points back. You remember that nonsense you do in Optimizer? You do that like uh, the this link list. No yeah. list. Yeah, yeah, like, oh, yeah, oh, that one. Yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm getting flashbacks. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. That, 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 that was me bullshitting with some students. We played around the marker board one day and said. I need a data structure that's not in a book. I didn't, I didn't. That's all we did. We just kind of bullshitted and came up with that one. Just to screw with you guys. <laughs> Magic book. Yeah, that was one where like you took a note out and you had to like put the weave in. Yeah. 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 East West. That, right, that, that, right. Was, that was one hour after one class. We, we just kind of came up with that. I, mean, this I don't remember that. That was a whole story. <laughs> all right. So this is it. So a couple, couple little problems here. Um, obviously, there's things that I can test and things I can't test. Um, so here. So in the test, oh geez, where are we? Um, <laughs> Control Shift T. Click the test here. Um, wanted to print these nodes, so I have a print node. This is really up to you how you want to do this, but um, you know everything's stubbed out, so everything will link there and everything else. But the print here is to print, you know, I print the name and then the links of it. So okay. on my code, where is it? Get rid of these guys. Can we get the print? Do you mind showing us the finished version of that? Yeah. Or? No, I'll, sh I'll show you the I'll show you the um, output. Um, so when I print a node here, I'm printing this one right here. And Thank that, you. that was a good one. Um, there, we go. there. So this is what I'm printing, right? Um, it's all nicely justified though. Driving me nuts that these things aren't aligned. All right, so what I do for print is I print the name of the node I'm currently on, my my address, and then it points to a parent, right? Here's the parent. Then I go to that parent and say, hey, what is your name? And print its name here. Because remember, we never debug pointers. I hope to hell we know that. We never ever 
if you if you did a linked list, I said, find your mistake. And if you're writing down numbers, you know, <laughs> and then did you recompile it? Guess what happens? The numbers change. Yeah. Right. And you would constantly the first thing you do is you give every single node a name and you print its name. And he goes, previous points to new name, you know, print its name. You don't ever look at pointers because you'll go nuts. So every time, so like here I just ran this and before I ran this, this probably had different numbers because it's a different memory snapshot. But the names are the same. This still points to A, still points to D and C, right? So print like that, right? Use the names. I'm not grading that part because it's impossible to grade your print, right? I could, I can be really evil, but then I'm gonna have to specify how to print and all sorts of stuff, I don't wanna go there. Um, the second thing I have is a function said, print all of its children. It's right here. Um, this is right here. Print the, um, print the whole tree. So this is going from the top down, step first, printing every node. So you can see right here. <clears throat> And then I have another one that says right here, uh, which is print, you, print the siblings. How do you validate the print? I just said that. I'm not validating the print. Okay. okay. So, you know, you're, it's really up to you, but trust me, you probably want a way to print this stuff out because it's going to be useful later. Um, so there's three tests that really I'm not doing much checking on there, but, you know, I just want to be straight up front about it. Um, there, there's, you know, like your style is your style for printing, but Trust me, I think it's better. You see how here, on this one right here, um, I have the word null. It really comes back as zero. And then I literally say, if pointer equals null, put string null there, you know, um, just because I want it to communicate it's a null, All right? Yes. Hold on, the question just fell out of my head. Oh, for print siblings, do you want, does that, do you interpret that to mean print left and right? Or do you mean go up to the parent and then go through and print all the siblings and that? Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> How did you interpret that? I don't remember which one is this. This is um, print siblings. Control shift T. No. We're doing it the hard way. Control shift T. Of course, I didn't give it a good name. Would a node be considered its own sibling? It's all true. Oh, maybe it's like your previous and next like sibling. You just print that. Oh, I tell you what it says, which should print I'm, a nice, I'm expecting these numbers. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm telling you right there. So I, I took the guesswork out. And so yeah. So but, that's everything except itself. Yeah. So we're printing E. Oh, no, E. Um, it looks separate. like it includes itself. It includes yeah. itself, yeah. right. It so what's going to do is siblings, it's, it's going to jump up to the parent, go back down and print eldest down yeah family portrait kind of thing yeah <clears throat> um but everything's there if you get confused ask questions on piazza it should be pretty straightforward um too many questions okay. coming in what too many questions coming in where piazza oh don't worry no problem um the, like i said this is not as rough as it looks it's pretty easy now the i'm a real-time software development and recursion do not go together Right? Why? Because in real world, you can get enough of data that can blow up your stack. Yeah. Right? Your stack is adjustable, but no matter what size you give me the stack, I can find a way to break it. It's very easy. <laughs> so we don't like recursion. So everything you've heard to this point, like recursion, recur it doesn't work in the real world. <clears throat> right? It's a cute concept. I love it. It's cute, but it doesn't work. Um, but for this assignment, to print the tree or something like this, recursion is okay because, no, no. The I'm reason why I'm saying it, it's short term, it's short term because this is PA1. PA5, guess what you're gonna do? Make an iterator. Add iterators. Yeah. So we're not gonna stay with, you know, this is just a, a step towards that. Um, to add iterators on top of this would be a nightmare. Um, it's a for this first week. Yeah, it's a future nightmare. Right, no, but it's, it's an even more interesting nightmare. So what's gonna happen is, this assignment, I give you all the unit tests. Mm -hmm. You basically write the code and you'll know instantly, whatever you see past, that's your grade. And so there's nothing hidden, right? But when we get to week five, I'm gonna say, okay, add iterators. And guess what's gonna happen? I give you no tests. Oh. 
Oh, <laughs> because think about it. That's how the real world is, right? You're not going to be coding on something new and like, oh, I'm waiting for my manager to give me the unit test. You're not going to get the unit test. You're going to write the unit test, right? And so what's going to happen with that assignment is I have unit tests. Oh my God. Right? And we're both going to have the same spec and I'm going to grade you against my unit test. And I'm going to give you two bites out of the apple. So you turn it in, I grade it, and you'll see what I said was wrong. And you turn around and you can fix it one time and then I'll grade for your, for your final grade. Just to, just to be clear, using the same kind of interface from four, five, six for iterators where you do four. Yes. Yeah. Iterate dot yeah. first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we're going to do bottom up and top down. Bottom up? Yeah. Like from, no, this one you down here. start from children all the way up to the yeah. reverse iterator. Cute. <laughs> so do you, are, do you going to specify like breadth first, up first, or? It, it, it's going to be depth first. Yeah, for forward. Yeah. Okay. And, and for reverse? Time. Reverse is, it's, it's, you have uh, it. it's breath, bottom, going up. <laughs> <laughs> Here, I'll show you what I mean. It's not, it's not that. It's, I guess it is. Could you go back to your picture from the, from the PA? <laughs> that's a, it's more realistic. <sighs> All right. Um, this yeah, is, I can't draw on this, right? So I, I understand the forward and What would the reverse? Uh, <laughs> yeah, this would be a fun ride. I can see it right now. All right. Um, Hot keys. He doesn't like it. Command shift. Right. Command, right. Command shift. Oh, All right, ready? Okay. So, forward iterator. Um, let's get a different color here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh shit. Nice. <laughs> Tight. Control Y. Control Y. Yeah. Control Y or Control Shift Z. It depends on the program. Yeah. All right. We can just paste it again. Yeah, but this is still week five, so don't worry about it too much. But here, the rule is, you have to do the bottom before you do the top. So it's like double. So your first note here will go. You go across this there, right? Now you have to make sure all these are done before. So how would you go to the go to Q? Yeah. Yeah. Can, right? yeah. US next buddy. Oh yeah. Uh oh. Hmm? Oh P next. Okay. okay. So the, the rule the rule is you can do any leaf has to be done before the parent. Right? So this would start off this way here, right? And then no, C? yeah. Okay. So it's just the forward iterator in reverse. Essentially, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the forward iterator goes That'd this way. That's your hint, by the way. Yep. Now, but there's 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 a subtlety here, which is way more interesting. <laughs> you did already do right? the same thing. No, this is not. So here's where it's going to get a lot harder. Right, so then this kind of goes this way across there, then this. Remember, this is done before we get to S. S is done before we get to P. P is done before we get to this. Now, all of this is done before we get to R, right? So it's just reversing it. But here's the catch. You have to be able to do the reverse iterator straight. You can't pre-process the whole tree and then reverse it. <clears throat> So remember the trick I did in SC 456 yes. where I yes. said, I said, fuck it, it's late at night, we're doing it this way. We can't do that. So in in Space Simulator's class, I did a forward iterator and I kept the reverse. Yeah. And then I turned around and said, okay, go the other way. So I, I, I walked the whole iteration once and I walked it the other way to get the links, right? We're not doing that. As you add a node, you add the forward and reverse at the same time. So that's funny. Which is, which is this? Oh, I see. Every, so so you're you, you always, the add so our data structure has next previous, I mean, parent child, next previous sibling, and it has forward reverse, 
Hmm. We had two pointers there. And when you add a node, you fill in forward and reverse. When you remove a node, you fill, fix forward and reverse. Oh, okay. And so then your iterators just become walking those links, which real work is Get, then adding and removing those, those nodes. So that's what I'm saying. That's, that's, that's week five. That's why. Um, that's why it's not now. Not now. All right. So um, the last part is the <coughs> environment, and this just happened today. So, um, so I'm really thinking that we would go with direct X, just because I have at least two or more students are in this category, not on their fault. It's up in uh, Apple. I'm, Steve Jobs wasn't dead, you know, <laughs> he might be going there anyway, if he, if I got my hands on this, this is so long, you don't, you don't remove, you don't go like, you know what, let's go back to 1985 interface on brand new machines, it just it sounds wrong, all right, so I'm mad at him, um, anyway, uh, so what I have is an environmental uh, PA, and this environmental PA is to make sure every environment set up correctly, and so the first one is, you just run the compiler test and you cut and paste those two headers in there just to, you know in, in this so this thing runs here's the headers yeah what, what headers are you no, i'm showing you i'm just this this one right here um <coughs> you kind of paste that into um a text file sure right so both for debug and release the oh, reason why this is not working it's where I, I, yeah. I talk about this date. Right. They, they said 2022 with 2019 libraries, they kind of F-barred it. So, so you, you're asking us to post the results into yes. the node better. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. So um, so here's the, here's the test, um, environment test. You're gonna do the, run the first thing and you know, you're, you're gonna have this output, it passed, right? And then release, it passed. So this way I know your compiler is set up correctly with 2022. The second thing is print out the um, what OpenGL and DirectX now. <laughs> so I'm going to have to append this, but and DirectX, just run that program that uh, GL view setup yeah. and just run it for a DirectX. Well, you run it and you get kind of paste the DirectX part and the OpenGL okay. part. So this way I can get a history. I think I know my answer, but now I'm gonna make sure everybody has the right DirectX version, right? I checked the OpenGL version, but not the DirectX. Well, no, you have to check it. Yeah, yeah, but this is for this assignment. And the last one, it now will work for most of you, but a couple of you it won't work, is just to do the, the graphics test to see if this thing builds and runs. Mm -hmm. So if this doesn't work for some of you, um, and I can tell because you're, OpenGL will say 3.3 or something like that, then, then you don't have to do this part, but everybody else just, just run the graphics thing just to get a snapshot it, that's it. And so I want this <coughs> turn in uh, Saturday. It's, it's literally, if it just takes you more than 15 minutes, you're doing something wrong, right? Um, and this other assignment, so everything is due, how this works is all assignments are always due on Saturday. Right, so today is Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, right? So <coughs> this is where we're at and homework is always due here, right? So you get almost two weeks. For, yeah, this is the first week. You get, you get the first week is always the easy one, right? Yeah. Um, so the right here, this is the PA zero, which is that cut and paste those those pictures. And this is be PA one. Now, homework is always due Saturday night, so this way it's easy to remember. And for programmers, what is night? Night means birds are chirping in the morning the next day. Right? <laughs> so that's what night means, because there's no constant midnight. Come oh, on, yeah. you're like you're just on your second Mountain Dew. You're only just starting to code, right? <laughs> Um, so, no, man. <laughs> well, they, you're lucky because I, 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 you know, things are just going. You know, like, right? uh, that 5 a.m. wake up is rough. The last five Absolutely weeks of the previous quarter, everything is finished at like 
4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m. Yeah, that's right. Yep. So that's Sunday weird. morning at 7 in the morning. <laughs> we don't do that here. Sunday morning <laughs> at 7, <laughs> I'll, I'll look at it to grade it. Everything is done up front. If something happens, remember, you guys had kind of kind of landed in the club now, so I'm not going to like go, if, if you have a bad week or something, just email me. We, we can work out because what I want is for you to get this done. If I don't put the pressure on you now, some of you will be lazy and they're like, oh, shit, Ed, I can't do it. I'm like, I don't kind of, you know, my memory isn't done because that's hard and this isn't done and this isn't, you know, don't worry. I can cram my graphics done in like the last week. No, you can't. So I'm keeping the pressure on you guys, but if something happens, just email me. You know, yeah, private pass me and we can, we can work out something. Um, but try to keep it going on every week. Next week is math system. So we're going to go right into just talking about the library and doing the math. And what's nice about the math system, you don't really have to know much math because I'm going to go through all the math you need to know. Probably going to summarize all of Andre's class <laughs> in one, one class. Um, and it will make a lot more sense. So we'll be in good shape then. Um, the, the, what, what's, what's nice about the math class, the math assignment is no matter how complicated math is in programming, you just have to code it up correctly once. <laughs> and then, then you call it 100 times, right? And so this is not fair when you go to interviews and they ask you a math question and they go, here's the marker, go to the board and do this. And you're like, going, well, normally I, I have books open, I have websites or, you know, you know you know, Lisa over there is really good at math. She has a math degree. I mean, she just does math functions for us. You know, like that's how the real world works. But they interview you saying, all right, here it is, Vector Kelk, do it. I'm like, I don't use Kelk, you know? Um, <laughs> so, so the math, don't be intimidated. It's pretty easy going. We're not doing SIMD, you know, SIMD. You can do that on your own, but don't do it here. Cause you, you know, I got to pull you back cause you're gonna run on oxygen. If we did some D before, could we copy paste? Uh, if it works. I mean, it I remember works. it working. <laughs> it was, it was it was you don't understand, things are going to change. So, um, it's common to know. Yeah, this, yeah who, who can say it's a big project? Um, we're also going to have proxies. Um, and we're going to do, we'll, I'll share that later, a, a, a mathematical reduction on complexity okay. with a hidden system. Is really kind of cool. Yes. Uh, what are the release and due dates for PA2? So it's Everything's on Saturday. The next Tuesday and the due date is the it's next. It's, 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 it's every week. It, I don't know if you can see the pattern yet, but <laughs> kind of kind of have a pattern. I saw it. <laughs> yeah. The reason is I can't remember this stuff myself, so that's why I always do Saturday. And I was, I was doing Friday, and I was like, going, I wanted to go out Friday and it's date night, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, mom's in from out of town. And I'm like, going, all right, fine, screw it, Saturday. And I'm like, going, so, so this way I can just lose my Sunday dealing with this. And then Friday night, I start getting the thousand Piazza posts, like, I haven't started. How the hell do you do this? And all this other stuff, you know. <laughs> but, but this stuff here, I'll tell you this the best way to attack this class is. Don't look at this as work. Don't be stressed about it. Just nibble at it all the time, right? How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? It's just keep slowly chewing on this. It gets through. Pretty sure that's a felony. What? Pretty sure that's a felony. What? Pretty sure that's a felony. What is? Eating an elephant. You vote if it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Were you gonna let all that meat go to waste? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I like this like casual some apology for poaching. This is not smooth, right? Like, that's so we hit it with a car, right? <laughs> uh, things happen. I mean, this how the if I, someone I hit an elephant with a car, the would car would be dead. crashed. The elephant would be fine. <laughs> uh, it's like car <laughs> If you break an elephant's leg, how do you, how does the elephant live anymore? You have to put it down. I mean, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was in Ireland and they had an elephants. Elephant? Yeah, an elephant in Ireland. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and uh, um, they got it. The zoo broke down. The train broke and crashed, and so the elephant died at this town. And so the guy felt bad. So he wanted to give the elephant a cemetery. Well, you know, you have to drag the elephant. <laughs> 
across the town, and he had to dig a hole that's big enough to fit an elephant. So it was one hell of a cemetery. So he built a whole cemetery around this elephant. So it's called the Elephant Cemetery. Oh, no, it's in France. Sorry. Oh, crap. I can't think so. Give my elephant story for this out. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Welcome aboard. The water's nice. Um, and then some of you I'll see tomorrow, multi-threading. We can do yeah. multiple processors. You know. I don't know how hard that will be. What? I don't know how hard that will be. The oh, first this is the easy one. This is the e easy multi-threading class. Mm -hmm. Are both classes going to have assignments due Saturday nights? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I can't keep it straight. No, actually, I have three classes. All three are due Saturday night. <laughs> It'd be due on Saturday, even if it was... Even though the class was on Saturday. Everything's due on Saturday. We do the no, no, no. He's talking about the redos. Yeah. The redos. Oh, there's no redos. There will be no redos. Here. There's no redos. <laughs> <laughs> you guys broke me. Whoever was in the class last quarter broke me. Oh, no. There's no more redos. You guys have beaten me that out of me. Oh, I have no, students I bitching at me. I give everybody redos on every assignment and extra credit. And it's like, going, but I did it wrong. So can I do it again? I'm like, no. I'm like, how much, like, <laughs> no, so that, sorry. No more redos. You guys taught me. No more redos. Yeah, my answer to that one kids ask is no, because I hate you. And this is a good answer. You say what? No, because I hate you. I'm not allowed to say that. <laughs> I didn't hit them. <laughs> You're allowed to say that with your high school students? I mean, they obviously, I say it in that tone so they know I'm joking, but yes. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. I mean, they say it to me. I think it's only fair. <laughs> but they need it. <laughs> I mean, they can't prove I don't. What? Oh, wow, that's amazing. Okay, well, good job. Yeah, I learned that from one of my old coworkers. Like, Shh, I hate you. It's just so dramatic about it. It's so clearly clownish. She's very funny with it. Yeah, but if you ever were in a legal room and they did a transcript, it would look really bad. It would. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure someone reported it. Yeah. Oh, wow. All right, well, that's, yeah. I haven't been sued yet. I'm not going to follow that pattern. <laughs> All right, well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.